That's fine. I need one that I can wreck people with. World Cup. After dock out, we get a picture. Photo on this camera is like here, and then. Well, well. Welcome to our talk this evening. Um, I'm happy to introduce Roger Dingledine. Uh, President and lead developer designer of Tor, and uh, Jacob Applebaum, a recent immigrant to Germany, who is also the, uh, I think, lead advocate is, I think, a good title for Tor. And um, they are going to talk tonight to us about censorship resistance and surveillance. Um, enjoy. It's really fantastic to be here again, and I'm really happy that Roger and so many other tour people can join me this time. So we, we came prepared, but we wanted to say that there have been some things that have happened in the world since, well, we originally talked with Christian about giving this talk, and we thought maybe we could do one of two talks. We can read some slides to you, or we can play a choose-your-own-adventure game. So there exists some possibility here for an interactive talk, a more interactive talk. And so we can also make this decision by just doing a little survey. So how many people here are familiar with Tor technically or at least at a high level of some kind so that they understand it's more than just a bad name in German for something related to anonymity? Okay, we can skip the introduction to Tor. <laughs> Alles clear. So what do you think? Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, we could directly go into questions. We could jump into <laughs> we could jump into recent events. There are a lot of ways we can take this. Uh, we'd like to make this as interactive as we can because we're here to help you answer whatever questions you have about uh, Tor or anonymity or privacy or security or what's going on in the world. So there are a lot of variations on how we can do this. So uh, if you would like to do that, raise your hand now and start yelling out your questions. If that doesn't happen, we'll figure out a different plan. Okay, so I think just to be culturally sensitive, <laughs> you right there in the pink shirt, do you have any questions or think the people near you might have a question? Since traditionally it's hard to get people to raise their hand. No? Well, you do, fantastic, I knew that would work. <laughs> Sorry. That was minute three. three. All right. You'll notice that uh, each of us will have different answers to every question, probably. So we'll see how that one goes. Okay, and you? I didn't even know that rumor had been started. Uh, yeah, we can pass this microphone, maybe. So the question that the fine gentleman asked is, is there truth to the rumor that I am seeking political asylum in Germany? And the, I didn't know that that rumor existed. Um, I prefer marriage generally, but, um, just kidding. But uh, that said, uh, I don't think so. I mean, I hope that that is not a necessity. I'd like to think that our country where I currently have a house is still free, but that said, I do now live in Berlin and applied for a residency visa because I don't feel safe to return to the United States because the rule of law, as I understand it, does not really seem to exist in the ways that I would like. And part of the revelations that we have seen, you know, 
they speak volumes about that, right? Secret law, secret court, secret interpretations. To call that democracy is, I think, horseshit, right? And when those things are used with drone strikes and aggressive wars of imperialism, well, I mean, that doesn't make me feel great being outside of America, actually. But uh, that rumor, otherwise I had not heard it, so thanks for starting it. <laughs> Pass the microphone to that guy. It's a little bit tricky to look at this just as uh, the U.S. is bad and other countries are, are not so bad or are, are great. Uh, a long time ago, Andreas Fitzman, how many people here know the name Andreas Fitzman, uh, Dresden computer science professor? Uh, so long ago, we were thinking about the Privacy Enhancing Technologies Symposium, which is where all of the... Uh, academics who do great research on anonymity technologies go and for uh, I think the first two years it was in the US and after that it was in Dresden and after that uh, we we basically boycotted the US because uh, of their bad privacy approaches and their bad visa approaches and the fingerprinting and all of that and we said we're not going to force people even technologists and academics who are going to a, a country like the US to deal with that and two or three years ago we decided to stop boycotting the U.S. because the rest of the countries had caught up. It's now just as bad to go to uh, various places in Europe as it is to go to the U.S. with respect to all the various people who want to go there. So, so yes, there are a lot of bad things going on in the U.S. Don't think moving to Germany is going to solve it all. Okay, that basically covered my question. <laughs> I, can, I can follow up a little bit with this, which is to say, you know, if we, if we look at the U.S. and we try to demonize it, this is a really, like, it's a far too simplistic situation. And I'm actually pretty proud of being born in America. And, you know, I'm from the Bear Republic of California. And one of my childhood friends is actually in the audience here. And, and to say that, that you know, to, to just basically bash on America is to get the wrong message across. And that's not the case. And I think it's really important to set the record straight about that in that, the issue is not the American people or the country, it is that there are certain lawless elements in government that exist in the United States who in the cloak of secrecy have done things which 10 years ago we were ridiculed for talking about building protections against. And five years ago, when those things were used for certain ends, people still thought it was pretty crazy. And when I gave a talk at the 29C3 uh, last December in Hamburg, and I said that the head of the NSA was lying, and I said that they were wiretapping Americans and they were wiretapping the rest of the world. People still at that point denied that this was possible. They still suggested that this was tinfoil hattery and so on. And this is both to deny the facts that have been laid before the European Union, such as D Duncan Campbell's interception report to the European Union of 2001, I think. And it's also to deny a lot of the things that we see, the fruits of these surveillance programs sort of coming to bear, right? Like the notion of a signature strike. Right? What is a signature strike? It is metadata that is often gleaned from surveillance that is used for political assassination, right? Without a judge, without a jury, and so on. And so just seven months ago, people really were, I think, still in denial. And so the big thing that has happened is not that we have learned that America is the devil or something like this, but actually a few people in the United States have taken a Faustian pact, betrayed the democracy that does exist to some degree in the United States still, and under that cloak of secrecy, they have done things which are highly illegal, and they have encouraged similar people in similar positions in the German government, for example, as we know from last week's Der Spiegel article, to do the same thing. That doesn't mean that you guys are bad, except for the BND guys in the audience. <laughs> but, Probably not even individually. But, but the point is that these, these systems that exist, those systems have some people. Most of those people are actually quite good people. And America as a country itself, I don't think of it as a bad place. But I also don't think of it as a safe place for myself, my friends, and people that I really care about in certain contexts. And the German word that explains it the best for me is Zersetzung which I'm sure I just pronounced incorrectly, but those of you that are Osties probably realize what this word is and you know it quite well. And that is a, a current state of affairs in the United States for some political activists or people who don't consider themselves to be political activists but are targeted as terrorists because of the things that they say, that they think, that they believe, that they do with their computers. 
And so that's very complicated, and we should not just blanket dismiss the complication and sum it up as America is a bad place, because I feel like Roger and I give America a good name. This is a really interesting conversation to be having here. So Jake mentioned 10 years ago this, five years ago that. So four years ago, I was at a Dutch hacker conference. I think it was Har Hacking at Random. And I was on a panel where we were talking about freedom and freedom from surveillance and, and censorship and so on. And one of the points that I, I found really hard to drive home to the audience, everybody was saying, Iran is bad because they censor and they surveil. Syria is bad because they censor and surveil. I'm so glad I live in a good country. I'm so glad I live in the West where we don't do that. And part of the, the hardest message to give them there was, Actually, you can't divide things into those countries that censor and surveil and those Western countries that are free and provide freedom. You have to, you can't sit back and say, good thing I'm in Germany where they wouldn't do that to me. You have to start fighting for freedom all around the world. You can't divide it into, I'm glad I, d I don't live in over there good thing I'm free here. And, and here we are now trying to, to draw the lines between certain Western countries. You can't. There, there's no bucket A free, bucket B non-free. We need all around the world to have these technologies and policies and cultural approaches uh, that can maintain freedom everywhere. Yeah, and I mean, having just come from Dachau about 20 minutes ago, I feel like there should be pretty much no nationalist, uh, exceptionalist sentiment anywhere in the world. Because the lesson here is that humans exist, and given the right context, the right tools, the right political motivation, motivations, pretty much anything is possible. And we shouldn't forget, however, that people are the change for that possibility. But it can be a positive change, a negative change. And that, I think, with things like the Tor Network, can be a positive change. And what we are trying to do at the Tor Project, but in general, I think as human beings, I mean, I don't speak for Roger, but I guess I'll try, by saying, you know, we are trying to build alternative systems that increase human autonomy and liberty and agency. And part of this is technology. The Tor network is uh, obviously technology, and the people in this room that run Tor Relays, they are obviously technologically inclined. But it, the idea of anonymity, the idea of privacy, of dignity, and of agency, these things exist without computers and without the internet. They, they really can, if we want them to. Right? When, we have, um, when we have the um, Briefsgeheims, for example, this is not about capabilities, it's about fundamental you know, rights in the Grundgesetz. This is, a, this is not about what is possible, it's about what we as a society or societies around the world want to build. So what Tor is trying, I think, and successfully doing in some cases, is building alternatives that give people agency to change the world they live in and to take back some of the things that they have lost with the way that the networks have been architected and the way that the world has been building itself out. And we see this all over the place. So these slides in this deck, we have examples of where a country has blocked the Tor network and we see this and people say, oh, you're at war with China. But that's ridiculous. What we're trying to do is help people to have a nonviolent alternative where they can seek to use free speech and the ability to read and to communicate with each other. Not just for conflict resolution, but for simply being able to freely express oneself and to see the expression of others. And we have no battle with governments. Instead, what it is, is often those governments have battles with their own citizens. And sometimes our tool is a casualty of that, actually. And this tells you something about how those governments view the properties that the tool can enable in those societies. So this is inherently, in a sense, a political thing. But it depends on from which position of privilege you come from. Because in the American tradition, anonymity as a right is a fundamental thing that comes from the core revolutionary goals of the American Revolution against the tyrannical British. Right? There's a reason we shot them. It still exists today. Now it's called tempora. But, <laughs> right? and, and the thing is that, that in Burma, it's a little different. You know, when I was in Burma basically eight months ago, nine months ago, or something like that, you know, anonymity as a right is a well, let's just say it's not a given. But in some cases, people that are living there, they understand it as a necessity so that they may continue to survive. But that isn't to say that we are conflicting with the Burmese government. I mean, in a sense, I do personally, but I think that it's 
individuals who are choosing this. And so if we just talk about technology, we really miss a really incredible, like an absolutely critical part. And it was Roger actually that convinced me of this when he said that we aren't at war with China. Instead, what it is is that we're helping people to do things. And sometimes those people in solidarity with the Tor network have trouble. They have trouble because their government does not want them to speak freely, does not want them to have privacy, does not want them to have the dignity that this can provide to them on the internet when they wish to have an alternative. And it can't be about us trying to find out how China should change or how some other country should change. I don't know how China should be. There are a lot of people in China who have strong opinions about how their country should change, and we should give them privacy, protection, freedom, knowledge, whatever you want to call it. We should give them the ability to be able to change their country in the way that they want to change it, but that's up to them, whether they uh, do that this year or next year, or who chooses to do it. One of the other challenges that we have, when I was first starting out looking at uh, privacy enhancing technologies, I was about to say the phrase freedom technologies, maybe they're synonyms, who knows. Uh, when I was first looking at, at anonymity tools, I was thinking to myself, there are a lot of people out there who really want these things, and they're going to risk their lives communicating whatever, learning, publishing, reading, uh, is that on me? Should I, what, what sort of risks should I worry about for when they're going to use tools like this? And the answer is, now that we've actually done a lot of trainings and met with a lot of people around the world, they're gonna do it anyway. They're gonna go out into the streets and start yelling. They're gonna connect directly to Facebook. They're, gonna, they're going to change their world because that's more important to them than whether they're gonna end up dead the next week. So from that perspective, what, what I as a technologist need to do is give them the best tools I can, even though they're not perfect, to help them be safer with what they're going to do anyway. And fundamentally, you could also talk about this like the safe sex community does. This is a harm reduction strategy, right? So the cypherpunks that work on writing code to make privacy enhancing technologies possible, those cypherpunks are in some cases working on harm reduction software of a particular kind, or sometimes in a much general or social sense of that, but it's harm reduction. And there are some basic things that need to be done for these kinds of tools to be worth using or trusting. And I really think it actually extends to the whole of society, but you have to start somewhere. And perfection is, let's say, the enemy of the good enough in some cases. So free software, free and open source software, as the Free Software Foundation talks about it, as um, Christian Grutoff, who is here at the university, uh, works on with GNUnet, for example, Right? Free software is absolutely essential so that you don't have to trust us. That's really key. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't trust us as people. It just means that it is important that we distribute the trust and we distribute the verification. Right? So this is another key point, which is we need help studying. We need people in academia. We need people who are journalists. We need users. We need all sorts of information. And when we have that, it's very helpful. So solidarity and mutual aid. So mutual aid in this you can uh, help uh, you know, protect freedom online, as this poster says, by running a Tor Relay. I mean, it's a cute poster, which I appreciate the person that made it, but realistically, we really, if every single one of you went home today and ran a Tor Relay, the Tor network would be one quarter, of its, uh, one quarter larger of its current size. So when we talk about individuals making an impact in the world, literally, if every person went home and did that, it would really help people, and it does help people. And if half of you are able to understand these technologies and you help with that, that's also huge. Um, sometimes a little overloading. Um, but we think that these things are very important. And, and at its core, this helps to build alternatives, I think. And really working in solidarity with projects like GNUnet and the other things that Christian students are doing here, that's very, very important. And so if you're working on projects which you feel fit into this general idea that we're talking about right now, we really want you to come work with us. And in some cases, we may even be able to find funding to help you to sustain yourself while you work on things, instead of going and working at a big shitty corporation like Facebook, I mean Stasi book. And um, if, if you, you know, and if you'd be blown away by this idea that you could make a living writing free software, we, we wanted to come here to tell you that this is a possibility. And there are dozens of people in this room that do. And that really increases the autonomy of all humans in the world as everyone has access and everyone can use that. Speaking of trusting us, let me 
twist this from a more political, spiritual discussion to a more technical, let me give you a concrete example. So right now, you want to download the Tor software. You go to www.torproject.org. Your browser, if you're lucky, redirects you to the HTTPS version. Maybe you can get that, that's great. There are a lot of places in the world where that website is blocked, so they get it somehow. They get it from a friend, they get it from a Tor mirror or something like that. How do they know that the thing they're getting is actually the software that we wrote? How many people here have heard of PGP or GPG or something like that? Excellent, we're okay. In, we're in How German. many people here Germany. use Windows? We're in Germany. <laughs> Most of our users do. And we have some instructions for how to check the PGP signature on the download. The problem is most of them are on Windows, and the instructions start with download gpg.exe from this HTTP website. <laughs> I have no fix for this. These people are screwed. Maybe they need to go talk to their friends who know how to check these things. Uh, maybe they need to have more software that comes bundled with their operating system. Maybe they need to switch operating systems. But these are among the, the technical challenges that we wrestle with also. Can't we get an authentic code signature? Can't we say, dear Microsoft, here's our money. Can you give us a key so that you can promise things to people? Yeah, so, I mean, yes. we absolutely... <laughs> yes. Yes, we can do that, but what, it, what exactly do we do when we do that, right? We could do the same with Apple as well, but if you read the things that they want you to agree to, they want to restrict the freedoms that free software gives you in many cases. And this is a really terrible problem, and it would be fantastic if we had a solution in policy as well as technology to solve this. Another thing we could do, for example, is find a grad student here who's living on ramen, although this is Germany, so probably something much nicer than ramen, and uh, wants to add this to all the major web browsers. So by default, when you download a thing, you can check a peer-to-peer -peer signature system that doesn't require Microsoft to be in the loop or uses the Bitcoin blockchain or some really inventive solution that's distributed and actually secure where if they have a secure browser, or if it came with their computer, they have some hope in that. And so these kinds of problems are all trivially solved by academics, actually. Almost every problem we have has been written up and extensively analyzed, except for the really deep censorship-related things. So if you want to help with that, I think the authentic code might be an incremental step, but we'd like a real solution that every software project will benefit from as well, not just Tor. Um, I have a question on downloading uh, Tor. Um, how big is the chance if I use my PC and, as you described, downloads installation files, that at this moment my computer is tracked and as critical from one of these agencies the last, uh, we, we read a lot about the last weeks. So is it a, a recommended really to use a personal PC to download Tor or should I buy a prepaid card and use a computer from someone else and... <laughs> <laughs> I suspect we're going to have at least two answers to this one. Shall I let you? You go first. I go first. Okay. Um, it depends how paranoid you are. There are, <laughs> there are a lot of different problems that you need to think about and learn about in terms of having your computer be secure. Uh, long ago, we wrote a program called Tor. It was a SOX proxy. You could get it. You could run it. You could configure your browser to point its, its sessions through that. and all that application level data stuff, like cookies and whether you would run Flash and all of that, not our problem, your problem, good luck. And that was probably not a great decision. So, uh, and we were, we were talking to folks in Egypt who were saying, um, yes, I use Internet Explorer because I've never heard of Firefox. And please, can you make a, an Arabic version because we use the French version now. Uh, so we, at that point, built the Tor Browser Bundle, which comes with uh, a bunch of changes to, basically at this point it's a fork of Firefox. And it comes with a bunch of changes to fix uh, pretty serious privacy and security flaws that Mozilla doesn't consider worth fixing. Which is shameful, by the way, Mozilla. <laughs> and there's a lot more to it, and now that they're releasing every six weeks, uh, we're having a really tough time keeping up with all the privacy disasters that they put in every six weeks. And they're also really awful to the great Tor hacker, Mike Perry who is in the audience here, and if you know anybody that works at Mozilla and would like to help with this problem, boy, would you really make him 
happy, and he really needs help with that uh, in a pretty serious way. So if you're using the Tor browser bundle now, you've got, a, you've got your own browser, it goes through Tor, it disables plugins, it does a bunch of other stuff to keep you pretty safe, but there you are on Windows, so you go visit something, that something gives you an overflow in Firefox, they take over your computer, oops. Or, so that, that's, I mean, I, hopefully as an internet user, you're used to that concept. But there are a couple of other ways that these things can go wrong. Uh, one of them is you're on Windows, you go to some website, you use Tor to safely download a Microsoft Word file. So there you have this .doc file on your uh, desktop, is that what they call it? And then you click, click it, and it loads up. It has an embedded image link with a bunch of backslashes that turns into a net BIOS call that goes out at the kernel level. The kernel says, oh, a URL, I think I'll fetch it. Where do you set your proxy settings in the Windows kernel? Where do you set your proxy settings in Microsoft Word? Did you know Microsoft Word was a network application? Isn't that Microsoft's slogan a while ago? We can't tell them where the desktop ends and the internet begins. So this is a, this is a huge problem. And so one answer is you should run all of this stuff in a VM inside Windows. And then at least they'll have to break through that and maybe they won't be able to break out of the VM. Except you're already running Windows and you already went somewhere with your Internet Explorer two years ago and that place already broke in and now it has some sort of spyware to catch your bank account number and so on. Uh, so there you are running your VM to have Tor inside but you've got your spyware outside the VM. That's not going to work so well. So we have a, a live CD called Tails which uh, is Debian based and it has the applications that you should want and none of the applications that you shouldn't want. Uh, but you're going to, basically you can boot that and when you're done you unplug it and, and all of your state disappears. So that's probably the better way Not to do it. Not all of the state disappears. All of your state disappears, yeah. So there are a bunch of research projects showing interesting things that don't disappear. There's also the challenge most people actually like storing stuff once that they've visited websites for a while and they want to keep something. Maybe they're writing a document or whatever. Oh, you meant that kind of state? And then there's also the sort of state that he's talking about, which I'll let him elaborate on now. Yeah, so the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, so this is why law and policy matter, right? Basically, if you don't have a constitutional democracy with fundamental human rights, the answer to that question is yes. So right now, I believe the answer to your question is yes. Sorry. I'm, I really, I think it's terrible. But, but taking somebody else's computer and using that isn't going to be much better. So uh, maybe the answer to that question is no. Maybe you shouldn't do either of those. Uh, yes and no works for that. But again, I mean, how much of it has to do with law and policy and so on? I remember long ago I was arguing with legislators in the U.S., people who are actually making laws, and they were saying, there's this criminal activity. You know what we're going to do to stop it? We're going to make it illegal. We're going to make it illegal to break laws, and then people will stop. So, I mean, that's why we're here as technologists, to say actually there are ways to enforce security in ways that you don't have to trust large organizations that make promises and may or may not keep them. So if you use an operating system that doesn't come with Tor by default, you know, you have a bootstrapping problem, right? Like how do you have traffic analysis, resistance, and anonymity without the traffic analysis, resistance, and anonymity tool, right? It's, it's really hard, but you could use something like Tails or you can use a free software operating system like Debian, GNU, Linux, the universal operating system, and AppGet and Cell Tor, or something else like that. And really, I mean, if you want privacy on the internet and you're using Windows, you have to decide what you want. Privacy and the internet or Windows. And I'm not saying that because it is impossible to have privacy with Windows. What I'm saying is that it is really hard to do that. And we're probably not going to help very much with that because it doesn't help sustain an alternative. So using Tails and you tell us that it doesn't work and you file a bug report and we improve it and everyone gets those improvements. Right? It's very neighborly, you could say. And when you use Windows and they arbitrarily and capriciously break something, then you know, if we fix that, we spend a lot of time on basically just reacting to a system which is not an alternative. And if we consider the current events, why would we want to support people who collaborate with governments that commit war crimes? Right? So when you use Windows, you help kill women and children with drones, buddy. <laughs> But it's not just you. Uh, 
Not so. to bash on Windows too much, but let me tell you a fun or maybe terrifying story from a few years ago. So it was actually, I guess, six or seven years at this, ago at this point that I was doing a training of Vietnam activists uh, with a fellow uh, named Ethan Zuckerman. And they were telling us really scary stories. So we showed up and we're like, so there's this thing called Tor, you should use it. There's this thing called GPG, learn how to use it. There's off the record messaging. Here are these tools, they'll keep you safe. And they were saying things like, uh, yeah, I use encrypted Skype, but when I'm in the bathroom, they break into my house and they reinstall stuff on my computer. Or, yes, I, I use encryption, but there's a guy across the street with a parabolic microphone, microphone listening to everything that I say, so the encryption really doesn't do it. Uh, and at one point, they gave us an image of one of the laptops and said, I think this thing's been messed with. Can you figure out what happened? And we showed it to a lot of different uh, people who are good at forensics on Windows. And eventually, the answer turned out to be, Microsoft Windows does not ship with Vietnamese keyboard driver support by default. So if you want to be using Windows with the Vietnamese language, you go to the website that everybody goes to, and you download the spyware that's been backdoored by the Vietnamese Secret Service, and you install it. So every single person using Vietnamese Windows at that point, who knows about now, I have no idea, was part of the Vietnamese Secret Service botnet. And this came up because there was one point where five activists were PGP encrypting mail to each other, and the plain text of the mail showed up in the national newspaper the next day. And everybody's like, holy crap, is there a mole? Is, is GPG broken? Uh, what's going on here? And the answer is, they're just watching every, and, and it's, it's so bad, it's not just they can watch you, it's they read their mail and published it the next morning. And here I am talking about, you know, we going back to the previous discussion, the good country bucket and the bad country bucket. Here I am talking about Vietnam. Uh, I first learned about Deutsche Welle because it's a terrorist organization uh, as classified by the government of Vietnam. So that was then, this is now. We could probably talk about good methods and good strategies and good tactics in, in certain contexts. And I think that, that is an important thing to say. But for example, if you think that people have the right to read and the right to speak freely, it sort of suggests that adding a Trojan into the keyboard driver, for example, that everyone needs is kind of, it's kind of bad. It's bad news, you could say. So this is, there's a guy in the audience here who's one of the greatest people to ever live, in my opinion. His name is Gunner. He's the guy that sort of looks a little bit like Mr. Clean, but from California. <laughs> and um, and uh, I, I love you, man. So. Boom, love ya. And uh, you know, he, about 10 years ago, really convinced me that when we think about security and privacy and technology, we need to take a holistic approach. So now you know that we're both from California. And the thing is that what we're trying to do with Tails is make it so that if you have this kind of a problem, like you want to be able to type in your own language, you shouldn't have to be dependent on these non-free software parts that may or may not have backdoors. It's almost impossible for you to verify, even if you are a technologist, because maybe you don't have time. So we really are trying to work towards building free and verifiable systems. So Mike Perry has been going completely crazy working on building deterministic builds of the Tor browser so that you can compile a Tor browser, and he can do it, and you will end up with the exact same binary, exactly the same hash which is not the normal state of affairs these days with modern compilers and modern linkers and modern operating systems. And it's a lot of work, and he's surprised that he hasn't lost his mind using, <laughs> doing this job. But this is something where, you know, if you really want to think about this, you have to threat model. You have to understand the situation. You have to understand how much time you want the security that you think you're getting to buy you. And this is an analytical skill that takes a lot of practice and has very bad feedback loop closures because if you're doing a protest and you just need your security to last until the protest, well, if something goes wrong in the protest, or maybe it's not a protest at all, maybe you're just trying to have a private communication, that could be used later, right? In a total surveillance state like the United States or the rest of the planet, then you end up in a situation where that data will be used against you later in contexts that are not exactly clear. If you know this, it has a chilling effect on your speech. But in order for us to even begin to approach that, we have to have this holistic model. So it's why we're working on stuff like Tails. It's why we're working on stuff like Tor Browser. It's also why we're working on stuff like the Tor Router, so that we can have free and open source hardware, as well as software that will actually be able to take back the edge of your network in your house. It's why we want to build the ability to have forensics, like let's say, 
your forensically sound view of your own computer. Now that isn't something which we have even started with really. But this is the place we as computer scientists, as technologists really need to get so that we can even start to approach the operational security that we would need to start making strong promises and have a hope of having them work. And so, I mean, obviously Roger had thought about this before I had thought about it, and, and Gunnar is not the first person in the world to think of it, but he really nailed it by talking about the holistic picture. So there are things we really need to think about, and for that we really need free networks, right? If you can't download Tor safely, if you can't um, actually use encryption legally in a country, for example, there are some fundamental things that are missing. And so it's really hard when we use non-free software especially to get those things. We should probably take some more questions. And we have a, a really nice surprise, um, maybe not that nice, but kind of nice, which is that people that ask smart questions get a t-shirt, which normally you have to run a tour relay for. But what we're gonna say is that if you take the t-shirt, we believe you'll do the right thing and run a relay. No guilt. Some questions? Are there any women in the audience that have a question? Because it seems to be mostly a sausage party at this question point. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to get some computer scientists. Yeah. If you want to get up and line up um, out here, I think that that's what Christian would like. But yep. it does look like we're probably going to be doing Q&A for the whole thing. So. Sounds great. So another, uh, Jake was talking about the holistic side of things. There's also the research side of things. How do you assess anonymity? How do you decide uh, whether a network that looks like this is safer than a network that looks like this? There are a lot of people out there who say, I want to build my own paths through the Tor network because I think I can do a better job than the default path selection algorithm. And that's a really complex research question. Our answer for them for the most part is, uh, are you smarter than we are? Have you, have, you look, have you read all these research papers? If not, maybe you shouldn't do that. Uh, I'd love to have a better answer than that. And uh, just as a side note to that, when you think about building a system, try to consider that having a pure research paper, there are all of these people that have different levels of skill. So for example, if you have a research paper where you're totally certain you can completely beat all the censorship in the world and there's no implementation and no one understands it except three people in the world that are too busy to read your paper anyway, well, maybe consider also implementing it and making it free software from the very moment you start. So if you vanish or you get bored, someone else can take over from that. Maybe not necessarily as part of the paper, but really try to think about making it possible and then trying to integrate it with the systems that we built. Like we built a pluggable transport specification, which allows you to swap out how Tor talks directly to the network. If you have an ingenious way to get rid of protocol distinguishers in TLS, for example, or to super encrypt in a way that makes it super hard to fingerprint the packet timing information or any information about IP headers like Telex, which is a decoy routing system. We have really thought about everything else. You can just solve this one piece and if you build that interface, it might become something we ship by default, especially if it is reasoned and it is argued well and is peer reviewed. And, and this is something which, as someone who sometimes is an academic, I suppose, looking at the academic community, um, I see Roger having a lot of stress about the fact that these academics come up with great stuff, but then they have no connection to how it would actually be used, or there is no actual software that makes it possible, and we're all overloaded, so we can't sit down and implement every great paper, only to find out that actually it worked only on paper. So I guess, you know, not just in the ivory tower, but also on the bare metal. Yeah, thanks for your time and the talk. I really appreciate it. Um, question, is there, there are some legal hassles you can go into if you run a tour node as an exit node. So the question is, do you have recommendations on how to minimize the legal risks and uh, how useful would it be to run just a relay instead of an exit node? Yes, is the answer. And depending on which country you're in, there are different legal resources that are available. And for the most part, this is a good question to take offline because it's very contextual. But running a middle relay should result in basically no problems at all except really, really stupid sites that download the Tor consensus, the list of all the IP addresses, um, that is that our snapshot of the network. Sometimes some websites, like the Wikipedia used to do this, they don't anymore, download the consensus and just say, don't allow anyone from these IP addresses to edit. Um, for example, when I ran a Tor Relay for a while, I couldn't use any website in China 
on that IP address, but the IP address is near it, we're totally fine. So that's not really a legal consequence necessarily for that, but it's an unintended consequence, um, which is, by the way, a fascinating way to then scan the internet, because if you run a Tor relay and then you scan the internet, this gets back to the legal question, if you're able to do that, um, you might find that the results are different when you scan the internet from an IP address of a Tor router because many networks often will block Tor. And that's like fascinating as an external researcher without going to those countries, you can basically see uh, the uh, censorship from the outside. And so if you don't know about the port scanning question, if you don't know who you would contact to find that out, I would say if you're in Germany, I think there are some great resources. There's a guy who should be here tonight, um, Moritz, who is part of Tor servers, and he can probably connect you with the right German lawyers. Um, generally speaking, the best thing to do is go and proactively talk with people that you think might be the ones who would want to talk with you if something went wrong. Starting that conversation beforehand can be very powerful, and especially if you come to them and you teach them how Tor works. I'm not really very good at talking to the police in a polite way, so I would say that Roger could maybe be a little more diplomatic, but if you do that, you can really solve a lot of problems before they occur, especially if they understand that if they want anonymity for the things they do, you have to be able to help them and me. That's a hard thing for some people to swallow, but as soon as they see it as useful first, it changes the whole dialogue, and the framing is very important. But if you run an exit node, and it is a high-speed exit node, you know, you really, really should consider what you want, what you're doing, and where you host it. Like if you host it in a server rack instead of in your house, that might be useful, it might be good. Um, we know people who have had troubles, some of which have been basically nothing except stress because the police have come to their door, but we also know the people who have more troubles than that, and we also know people who have had no troubles. So, I, well, maybe not no troubles, but as an example, I've been running Tor Exit Relays for a while, and nothing ever happened to me about that. <laughs> so one of my side hobbies is teaching law enforcement how the internet works. I figure that will eventually come in handy in all sorts of ways. Uh, so it, it usually starts out with them saying, oh yes, Tor, I don't understand it, but it's your fault that my job sucks. And usually by hour two or three or something, they say, my job does suck, but I, I understand that it's not your fault. So that, that's usually about as far as I can get in the conversation. But I was talking to an FBI guy a while ago who was saying, okay, so here's the situation. I've got some crime. I have 10 IP addresses in some log file I found somewhere. If you can explain to me which IP addresses aren't gonna have anything, are not going to be useful for me to follow up on, I can do my job better, and your volunteers don't get hassled. So there are a lot, there's a lot to be gained from teaching the law enforcement people uh, how these things work and why it's not worth their time to do that. So I, I did a talk to a bunch of detectives in Stuttgart long ago, um, and earlier in January we talked to the Dutch Federal Police and the Belgian Federal Police. And we're, I think we're making pretty good progress in the U.S. at teaching uh, law enforcement how the Internet works. Uh, the Dutch people were already pretty smart. The Belgian people could sure use some more work. Uh, the Germans are, are sort of in between. The, the Stuttgart ones were the, the only group comfortable enough with English to be willing to meet with me. And that's not a good sign if you're not so good with English and your job is cybercrime. So, I mean, there's a lot to be done here and this is something that, that this audience especially would be really valuable at. Uh, if you, if you happen to find a police person, say, hey, would you like me to explain SSL to you? Would you like me to explain TOR to you? And at that point, you start educating them, and it's, it's no longer us versus them. It's no longer those, those ignorant people who keep abusing power in ways that, that we're uncomfortable with. Because uh, when you talk to these people individually, they're nice people. The folks at the Dutch Federal Computer Crime Unit, they're us. They just happen to be employed by the Dutch government to do bad things. Some of them are nice. So individually they're nice. When you put them in a big group, then they turn evil. So how do we, how do we make use of that? I think there are a lot of different answers for that. To go back to your original question, what is the legal liability and how can we deal with this? Uh, if you Google for, or if you, you know, do your favorite search engine for uh, Tor exit guidelines, then you'll find a big list of some of the stuff he said, 
but there are also some technical approaches you can do. Uh, make sure the who is entry points to you, not to your ISP. Try to get your uh, uh, name lookup to say something like, this is a Tor exit relay, look at this dot whatever dot DE. Uh, there are a lot of things like that that can uh, make it easier. Because if they, if they start out thinking, there's a crime and he's the criminal, nothing you say is gonna help at that point. Right. But if they start out thinking, there's a crime and he knows something about it, then they're gonna say, oh, he knows about computers, I'm, can you teach me what's going on here? And part of our job to make Tor succeed is uh, somehow we need to educate the whole world about what security means. So just in, in general, you get a t-shirt, and then, yeah, there you go, take it, run a relay. <laughs> Call us if you need uh, some more legal advice. Uh, we're not lawyers, and we're definitely not your lawyer. But uh, I wonder, since this is a group of computer scientists of which half of you have started to fall asleep, if, um, I know what it's like to be you here, jeez. <laughs> I won't take it offense, it's a little late, but I wonder, are you guys interested in these things that we're talking about? Is there something that you wish just topically that we were addressing a little bit more? And if you're not comfortable saying it, say it anyway. So we're only here for a short time. Yes? Oh, oh yeah. Okay, so on the social policy, um, being a fighter for democracy side, and not on the technical side, do you think, are you winning, are you losing? Is it a wash? Well, I mean, I don't think democracy is the be all end all with this, right? I, I said it earlier, this is about liberty, agency, dignity, right? These things are important. Democracy is not the only way we can have it. I would like to think that there are things that go beyond it. Thoreau said that, in fact. Is democracy really the last place? I don't think so. And are we doing well? Well, I think, actually, you know, well, you shouldn't be proud generally in a nationalistic way, Germany right now is keeping the debate about NSA spying alive. The rest of the world is falling asleep in a sense. So people here in Germany and different publications are really making incredible stuff happen. And I think that's impressive. You guys have a powerful voice and the reason is the history of Germany is horrible. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. When someone like me goes to America and says, this is like the Stasi, Right? The Sussetsong of the FBI is like the Sussetsong of the, you know, of the Stasi and other regimes when it is applied in this way. The wiretapping is similar. The interference is similar. The other things are similar. It means nothing. Americans don't care. But when a Stasi agent says that and says, damn, we'd still have the GDR if that was true, why didn't we have that then? That is so powerful. So really, there's a lot to be done there. And in that regard, when Germans have been speaking out about this, it really has been the case that I have felt like we're keeping this alive past the one or two day media cycle where something flares up and then goes down. So is that winning? I don't know, I'm not sure. But I think in the end, we're starting to see people that understand that law and what is possible and what is happening are not exactly aligned with law all the time and their interpretation of it. And that is really powerful, to make that progression. And so that is key. And that is actually something where we, I would definitely say we're winning. Where people understand now that the, the law actually doesn't change. You know, if you have a constitutional democracy and wiretapping has specific regulations, then by allowing the German government to wiretap all of you, they also let the NSA wiretap all of you. Which has no German constitutional protections in the Verfassungsgericht does not weigh in, none of the Datenschutz matters, it's just, it's just over in that regard. And that wake up call is huge and it's happening in every country in the world in this regard and that they realize they have to build a system that is just even if they're not on top, which is a huge wake up call. And that is really important and you guys, all of you guys, when you speak, you really speak with authority that moves the whole planet. So that's, that's a winning thing. On the losing side, the problem is that we live in a total surveillance state which is used for political assassinations. Fuck, that is seriously problematic. So for those people that are killed by drones, for example, I gotta say they lost. And we lose too when we let things like that happen. There are a lot of different uh, educational problems going on. There are a lot of different types of people out there who have a lot of different perspectives. I think the biggest problem is people who don't know anything about what's going on. And I think that's changing a lot in the past month or so. 
Uh, but I was talking to Jake at the, at, before we started the talk. Um, I was at one point trying to talk to the, I think she's an assistant to the, the, to the head lawyer in the US. Uh, and this person was, I think, Valerie, what's her name? Valerie Caperoni, the FBI's uh, legal counsel. Yeah, so <coughs> she... Bitch. <coughs> <laughs> so I was meeting with the uh, legal assistant to this person, and the, the person I was talking to was arguing for CALEA, uh, Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement. Basically, we need to put back doors in every technology so that we can surveil everything. Otherwise, how could we keep up with all of those criminals? So she was saying, uh, Congress, the US Congress, gave us, the FBI, the Department of Justice, the ability to watch everything. They, they passed a law saying that you get to watch everything. And you, the technologist, she was pointing at me, you guys are not letting us have the, the powers, the capabilities that Congress said we could have. So here you are in this nice judicial system. You, we give you good tax breaks. We give you, you know, clean water, nice laws, freedom, democracy, all that. And here you are taking advantage of the system. Here you are cheating. You are not giving us the powers that we're supposed to have. Why do you hate America? Why are you not allowing us to have the law enforcement abilities that, that Congress told us we should have. In her world, there was no, we're trying to get more powers than we used to have. In her world, it was, we have these powers, but we can't use them because of those damn technologists. So could you please stop that stuff so that we can use our powers to surveil everybody? And then when she said, you're only doing it for the money, I know how companies work, and I said, actually, we're a nonprofit trying to save the world. Then she was really confused. She was thinking, wait, there's a nonprofit here? Aren't they supposed to be the good guys? But here they are ruining the world, destroying everything, making it impossible for us to track all the bad guys. That was a, that was a rough conversation. And as you know, from the things that have come out in the last month, very few companies are willing to have the integrity that Roger Dingledein has. Right? I mean, that's really important, right? When all of these CEOs are lying about being complicit and giving up data and keys and other things, sometimes it's because the law prevents them from speaking. But they're in that position because instead of quitting or leaving, they became complicit. They know. And this is really important. And we once talked about how this time might come. And at least for me, I think that the time has come in that it wouldn't be reasonable for me to work on tour and live in the United States anymore. And it is more important for me to work on tour and to work on these technologies than to stay in a country that does not value human autonomy and liberty the way that it did when I was, I don't know, five years younger even. And that discussion that he's talking about is a representative sample of some of the things that are happening behind closed doors. And so all the services that you're using, with few exceptions, have probably had similar conversations with completely different outcomes. And that is awful on a number of levels. But that said, what an amazing guy. I'm so, not willing to give up yet. Yeah. So we should really try, like, this side of the room has said nothing. You guys have been in line a lot. But just, are you happy so far? Are you bored out of your mind? Yeah? Give me a thumbs up if you're happy. Give me a thumbs down if you're unhappy. That was a thumbs up, but OK. <laughs> Anybody here? Just quick, signal. Give me a covert channel. Give me a, an over channel. You're unhappy. Okay, unhappy guy in the blue shirt. What do you want to hear about? Oh, okay. Well, I just came from Dachau, and I've got some dust on my pants. And I think that it's probably worth considering that if you don't want to return here again, you have to stand up for other people and yourself, even if you don't see value in yourself and your own privacy. That's why. Because when the US has a death camp called Guantanamo Bay that force feeds people, which is torture under international law, and they murder people with drones, and you don't do anything about it, you are complicit, you personally, right? And so when you at least care enough to stop that, we might have a chance of turning it around. And that's why, but also because you will be less free. When people can spy on you, they can twist what you do in your life to suit their needs, to blackmail you. They can do other things like deny you jobs for the things that you dare to search about by what is in your profile, and it will impact you. And soon you will lose the ability to make that choice. And when that time comes, you may wish, if you have integrity, and I don't know you, 
But if you have integrity, you may wish that you had done something then. So do something now, before that time arrives. And I've spent almost my entire life in America, so this is not just about the country. It's about the political, social context and the fact that everyone else in this room may have not spent the rest of, or half of their life, or most of their life in America, and they're people too. So when Obama says, it's okay, we don't, we don't spy on anybody that's an American, he's implicitly suggesting that he's at the top and you guys are below. And that's wrong, just flat out wrong. And that's why you should care, because fundamentally, in Kohlberg's uh, stages of moral reasoning, you should be a level six. You should think about universal human rights beyond national borders. And when you see terrible things happening to people, you should not let it happen. You shouldn't just be silent, and you shouldn't just be selfish about it. And that's super important. And I bet now you'll think about that. Maybe you won't make a different decision. Maybe you will care about those things. I don't know. But I hope that you do, because it is exactly with you that these things change. Let me try two more concrete examples on you from the US side of things. So in the early 1950s, there were a lot of people in the US who were saying, you know, maybe this isn't really the right way to do government. Maybe we should explore other options. Maybe there are other ways to do it. And a few years later, there was the whole communist scare, and they brought all sorts of people in front of Congress and said, uh, are you or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And all the people who had ever in the past been thinking about communism, suddenly they were all criminals. So fast forward 40 years, 50 years, there are a bunch of uh, Muslims living in the US. Their religion says you should donate to a bunch of nonprofits and you shouldn't ask too many questions. Sounds like a pretty good thing to do. Suddenly, the people, a few years later, the people who had donated to certain nonprofits were all assisting terrorists. So again, the really scary thing here is huge data sets are being collected about the past. So what's the third example I'm going to come up with? where now you're doing something totally normal, writing free software to help people provide anonymity on the network. My birthday party. And a couple of years later, somebody says, everybody who's ever worked on the following thing, retroactively they're a criminal. Let's go look them up in the database, build a big list of them, take them somewhere. So the problem here is we have no idea what's gonna happen in five or 10 years in terms of public opinion about doing totally normal activities, and they're building all the data sets, and then they're losing all the data sets. It's not just one government here with a big data set, it's everybody sharing data all over the place. So 20 years ago, uh, in the military, you all know the phrase, need to know. You've all seen it in movies and so on. Apparently the military people now are saying the phrase, need to share. That's what happened in between 9-11, before and after. Now they're all, how do I give everybody else my data sets? And of course, this produces you know, embarrassing situations for them where some dude at the State Department publishes a whole lot of cables to 1.7 million people with clearances and then something happens and they all get angry. Uh, how do you deal with all, this, all these private data sets? This is not gonna go well. Do you want all your data in it? And I think a key thing to consider is that, and I've said this many times before, right? The data trail that you leave behind may be made up of individual facts that are correct, maybe not, but the prosecutor that reads that data trail, they get to tell whatever story they feel. And they may not have to give you exculpatory evidence, for example. And so the really scary thing is it's not, it doesn't matter if you think you have anything to hide. It doesn't matter if you think that you're doing nothing wrong, as Roger has said, with things like writing software. What matters is that if someone else wants to prove that you have done something wrong, you're totally fucked. That is not a world we should live in. I mean, really, it is seriously problematic. And that has actually bitten me twice in my life. Most recently, I had my 30th birthday party in Hawaii in April, for example. Man, was that a super bad choice. But how was I supposed to know that? I didn't know. It was impossible. And if it's not obvious why that is, could be a problem in, in a, a data retention society, don't worry, I'm sure it'll come up at some point. And it's super scary to imagine that I have to think about how I live my life with a double consciousness. Most of the women I know, for example, have this double consciousness anyway. So it's kind of a humbling experience to experience it. But there's how I see myself, and then there's how the world and specific people in the world see me as I go about my day. So the women that I know in my life say, how do I look? How would I look to an attacker? Right? Lots of people ask themselves that. I'm guessing you don't, probably very often. You're a pretty big guy. Right, you look strong, you probably kick the shit out of me for making an example out of you. <laughs> Please don't. 
But uh, <clears throat> that said, that is the double consciousness that we will all have soon enough. Only it won't necessarily be about sexual assault, but it will also be about sexual assault. But it'll be about a lot more, right? So these people in Yemen that are getting drone struck, they have that double consciousness right now too. And it's about being murdered. And then the question is whether or not those people thought that what they did when they bought a used cell phone at a market, for example, was something to hide. And usually the answer is no, it's not anything to hide. So when you judge yourself, you just have to remember that you're not the judge of your own goodness or life, and you will not have an opportunity to defend yourself in a system that is built with these tools, with this architecture. So that in itself, I hope, would convince you, even if it's just pure selfishness. But the other things I said and what Roger said, I hope they convince you too, because they're important. And when we give these things up, we, we build a prison around ourselves, or, you know, prism around ourselves. <laughs> Zing. Right? So, you know, Rosa Luxemburg had some things to say about people that don't uh, move and notice their chains, right? So don't let it get that far. And for some people it already is. So maybe try to help them and try to not get there. Get in line, get in line. Please. If you want to, yeah. Yeah, so uh, previously you gave that example with uh, downloading the Word doc, opening it, and then who knows what happens in the Windows kernel. Did you give that example because you know anything specific, or did you give it because it's theoretically possible because it's not open source? Oh, uh, it's... And, uh, sorry, uh, just another question which continues, which bases on that, I think. Um, all right, since the launch of uh, Windows 8, to be able to get the logo, you have to put it on a computer which has UEFI. And, okay, I can install Linux, still I have that UEFI. How do I deal with that? I think it's smart enough to circumvent anything which the live Linux distro can do. I think I can do this pretty quickly. Okay, so first of all, stop using Windows. <laughs> Seriously. And the reason we made the comment previously about uh, torrifying uh, torrifying um, any sort of application like Microsoft Word is just that torrifying an entire operating system is just really difficult, right? Tails, which is, you know, Debian derivative, amnesiac CD where you boot it up and it takes care of everything. Um, there are so many people working on it and so much effort has gone into it. It's a great project. The people that work on it are awesome. They have saved people's lives. You have to do all that work on a Windows machine. And it's some version of Windows and you have to have experts that have reviewed it and you have to really do the analysis yourself. And so it's just really hard. And so literally we see people who will download a .doc that has an image file in it and then they open Microsoft Word and they've used Tor Browser and they've used it correctly and they're on the internet and they open Microsoft Word and sure enough it does connect out to the internet directly and it gives away their IP address and it fingerprints them. And that really does happen. And you know, if you were to run a document leaking service for example, like some people do, those people often get those types of attacks. I just worked on reviewing one um, and reviewing this program, and part of the thing that they do is that they, they, well, they basically didn't really defend against that kind of stuff to the degree that we think they did. Or maybe they have, but we'll see how well it works over the long run. So that's, that's actually not a dig at Windows, in that it's just super difficult to actually know that you are staying private when it's complex to configure all of those things. And there's a thing that's coming out at Black Hat or DEF CON, which none of us have reviewed, and it has a name that is kind of not so respectful to the trademark of Tor and will confuse people. But I think it's called Tortilla or something like that. And it's meant for Windows users to Torify themselves. Uh, you know, but stop using Windows. And, and, and some dude's gonna run Internet Explorer with that and say, I'm so glad I'm safe. Yeah. <laughs> So, so really, I mean, the, and you're going to run Windows anyway, and I get that. So compartmentalize, right? That's the best advice that I can give you. It's a non-technical solution. Don't use that computer for political activism and writing your thesis. Although I don't know how you use LaTeX on a computer that runs Windows, but I'm sure it can be done. Um, but realistically, like the new version of Windows with EFI, you just hit the nail on the absolute head as hard as possible, which is that when our computers have non-free binary blobs inside of them, 
that have a signing key for Windows and they begrudgingly help Linux users use those computers, you are seeing Microsoft's dominance and I hope the EU smashes them as hard as possible so that those things just don't happen. And so Core Boot, for example, is a free software uh, replacement for the bring up of the board and you can give it an EFI payload or you can give it a traditional BIOS payload such as with C BIOS, S-E-A BIOS, and try to support companies that build motherboards that support that so that if you do want EFI and you do want to have the ability to run things like that, you may have the possibility of having it at least be all free. But then you really also need to take it to the next level and start help building free hardware like the stuff that Bunny Quang does, for example, with the Chumbi and other devices. Because it's, I mean, EFI is awful, I think, and I think all of the rest of this stuff is, yeah, gefährlich. You get a shirt too. And you can come talk to us afterwards, but we're being really bad and long-winded. Can I ask another question, just a quick one? You can ask two, that was the first. Yeah. Uh, you said you have some Tor router. Is that actual hardware? So let's just say that we're working on some stuff, and if you contribute to the Debian project and it is useful, and there are packages in Debian, that there may be in the future a case that something like that is going to be useful, and people will benefit from it. And uh, we can talk about it later when I'm not being videotaped and speaking in front of a lot of people about that. But well, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this and I've been working on it for more than four years with other people to the point where Tor people probably want me to stop working on it. Um, and we've repurposed tons of proprietary hardware stuff and we found ourselves constantly shafted by proprietary hardware companies. I even had one proprietary hardware router light on fire in my house. I mean, just talk about not worth investing our time in. So. But, but the real problem, I think, is that the uh, ISPs, lot, lot, uh, many, many times they impose the hardware you should use. And from a legal standpoint, uh, I don't know exactly how it is in Germany, but I think the network includes the router. So you don't, you, you're not allowed to mess with that, say, for, for example, a cable modem. modem. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I have the Tor router, what do I do if the company imposes their own router? I don't even know. That's a yeah, so there are several things, but one of those things is you're probably going to need some pretty good policies that make sure that you can bring the edge of your home and have your home have whatever you want in it. And there are people that work on that. Most of them, I think, are in the net neutrality space, but some of them are in other spaces. And another thing is that when we build something that's useful enough for you, it might also be useful for those people to stop investing in proprietary hardware platforms also. Because most businesses that I have met, like, I don't know, some of the people at, at Telecom here in Germany, for example, I think in this community they don't have the greatest name, but um, I find them actually really interesting in that they really care about economic sustainability of the things that they're doing, and they would be happy to, I bet, though I don't know for sure, they'd be happy to do something that makes business sense as well as the rest of the sense, especially if it got the net neutrality people off their backs. So there's, there's stuff going on there, and that's a complicated question. So, we can talk a little bit about it later, but that guy right there just also clued in to the fact that he knows something. So you should talk to him, and we should let the next guy ask the question. All right, thanks. So first of all, thanks very much for this discussion. It's great, amazing format. Thank you very much. Um, my question is regarding to uh, nationalism and freedom of speech, as you talked about it. I, I personally use Tor myself too, uh, and I really love it, but I see it rather as a tool. And so far, we talked about it as, as something that, that makes things better. And, um, but let's say I want to build up my, my nationalist network. I want to build up my, my, you know, my child porn network. Isn't, can, can't be Tor also used in a bad way? So is it in itself uh, necessarily a good thing? There are a bunch of different answers to this. We'll try three or four. Do you want to take the first one or shall I? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I get trolled by a lot of people about this, and uh, I respect that you are coming from a position of respect, and I want to honor that and just say that I appreciate your trolling. <laughs> and your sincerity at the same time. And I think the question is, are you a fascist? And uh, just, just feel free to answer that. Are you? No. Okay, great. So then don't censor people even if they say something you don't like. Because if you do, 
you will be censored by the fascists. This is a super simple, super simple idea here. I understand that that's super controversial in Germany, especially because there is censorship, and I understand that, and I know my Americanness is really showing right now. Let me try a few other answers. Wait, can, just can one I, second as a follow-up. <laughs> But when, so, but when you, just one second, when you do that to a tool, that's where the real problem is. Because as soon as we compromise our tool, you put us in danger, in fact. So then we are beholden to those fascists in a special way. So we need to remain neutral to that, or it actually puts us at risk. And there's a fantastic guy by the name of Zuko, and he says, I don't design for users versus the government, because that's just not the right thing. Instead, it's me and the Zeta cartel. The Zeta cartel is going to come, and they're going to ask me to do something. If I am able to do it, maybe they won't kill my family. Wouldn't it be better if the Zeta cartel never came, or that when you complied, nothing happened, and so they're really, really not interested in coming? So, in theory, I kind of don't want fascists to be promoting, for example, genocide. And actually, in practice, I don't want that. But I don't see any way for everyday normal people who are not criminals to have privacy and anonymity if we don't share it with everyone. And that is a super controversial thing. And Roger is now going to say a much better, more nuanced version of the same thing. And hopefully, he'll really convince you. So there are a couple of variations on this. Bad guys on the internet are doing great. If you're willing to break the law, if you know how to build a botnet, if you care a lot, as many criminals do, sure, there are dumb criminals, people catch them. There are a lot of organized criminals. They're doing great. Where does your spam come from? It doesn't come from some computer in Eastern Europe that if we could just find it and turn it off, we'd solve the spam problem. It comes from everywhere around the internet, broken into computers. So the bad guys are doing great. They're getting good anonymity. The good guys, not just individuals and activists and so on, but also corporations and governments and militaries and law enforcement, if you call them good guys, all of them think of themselves as good guys. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these different types of groups who are trying to do these things legally, they have very few options. So yeah, you can look at it as, uh, it's a two-edged sword, there's the, you know, there's the good guys, there's the bad guys, we'll help them equally, should we, should we allow that? And that's, I guess, a worthwhile debate, but it, it's, it's, not the right, it's not the right reality. Right now, the bad guys are doing great, and the good guys have very little. So, I mean, uh, there's a, a story, I don't know if it's true, apparently uh, when cars were first invented and they were selling a few, law enforcement said, these things are terrifying. Bad guys can rob a bank and just drive away. We've got horses, we can't catch them. We must regulate cars. Otherwise, there's gonna be total chaos and civilization will collapse. And there was serious consideration of that because cars are really dangerous to civilization. Except now we kind of think they're worthwhile. Right. All right. I completely agree with you, actually. There's, just, there's a the second point. There's is, a sec the point is uh, that I want to point out that I think Tor itself isn't really doing the good thing, right? It's, it's the tool to enable people to do good things. Well, just want, uh, like, uh, yeah, I mean, thanks for the backhanded compliment, but I mean, the thing is that, so first of all, Tor is a project, we have tons of tools. Like Tor Browser, we are improving Firefox, right? It's not just about little t Tor, the C program with 100,000 lines of C. But the architecture actually is a, a good thing that we are doing. Because what we have done is we have taken ourselves out of the position of being able to fuck you over. And that's really important. I mean, it's very important, and I think our ethics are reflected in our tools and in our goals and in the architecture and in the threat models and how we want to be verifiable, and we hope that you'll get this from someone other than us, right? Those, those things, I think, are reflected. And there's a great story that Roger told me, which you mentioned child porn, and I think, you know, this is like always, you know, child pornography, terrorism, money laundering, uh, the war on some drugs, right? Those are the four horsemen of the infopocalypse that everybody always throws out. No one ever talks about cops that beat people up and using the internet, right? How many people have seen someone at a protest being beaten up in Turkey recently, for example? Anybody seen that on the internet? Maybe in another country sometime? We shouldn't cripple the internet for dirty cops, right? And there are a lot more dirty cops than there are child pornographers, I think, probably. Hard to know, love to see a sample. Right? But the thing is that if you have a tool 
and someone is being abused, that is, there's a child that is being abused, and you have this tool, and you say, gosh, we should take care of that, we should get rid of that tool so this child won't be abused anymore. There's also someone in Syria right now who isn't maybe even fighting in the revolution or the civil war, or whatever you want to call Assad committing a genocide against people, right? If you take away Tor, you don't stop the child abuse, and you do harm the person in Syria who needs that help actively. The problem with child porn is that people are raping children. That is a societal problem. That's the same with fascists. fascists it it, it is same. exactly the same as fascism. And you children. might even say that fascists are often child rapists based on their actual behavior, because that is violating the autonomy of another person. But the point is, if you take away Tor, you cause a net harm, because really awful people that are going to commit those crimes those really awful people are going to commit a pretty simple crime compared to the other more heinous crimes they're interested in. You see this with Assad and his campaign against the Syrian people right now, where more than, what, 70,000 people have been killed? So try, I think, to consider that. And I, I think it's straightforward, but I know it's controversial because in Germany there, there is a problem with fascism. It's about flattening power structures. It's about giving power to people who right now don't have it. And the bad guys, for all sorts of definitions of bad guys, are doing a lot better than the good guys. Yep. Somebody around the world needs to fix that. We need help. Yep. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh yeah, do you want a t-shirt? Uh, there you go. Do your part to fight against fascism. <laughs> so uh, we've got the tool, obviously, and we, we've got two. We've got our tool, so Tor, and uh, Tor, including the browser packages, they're easy to use. But still, after the recent Snowden leaks, the user base has not really exploded. So what do you think does it take to well motivate the broad masses out there, so the 99% to? actually, well, become self-aware that something is not quite okay. Because that obviously has not happened. Legislate privacy by design. It's not necessary that it's Tor. What needs to happen is that people need to understand that technology and what's possible and the law are not at all exactly as they think they are. And it's really hard, especially when politicians are old lawyers who cannot imagine that these things are happening. That's huge. But also that some of those politicians are not free to speak because they're underneath that kind of regime. And it, it is true that we haven't seen, you know, tenfold Tor user increases, but there are lots of people from places you would never imagine who are saying, hey, what is the future of the internet? Do you mean we shouldn't outsource our entire government to Gmail? <laughs> so those conversations are really happening right now, and it's awesome to see those happening. So don't, don't despair yet. It's pretty soon afterwards. And what we see also is that there are people, when they understand this, that take action. Like during the Green Revolution in Iran, or what was supposed to be the Green Revolution, where they were really trying, where Netta was uh, shot in the heart, that girl who was sadly displayed on the video. That exact time, we saw huge amounts of Tor use, but we saw tons of people around the world who started running Tor relays because they wanted to take action. So like Hemingway went to Spain and Orwell went to Spain to fight against the Franco fascists, we saw literally 1,500 people over the course of that year tossing up relay names with, you know, relays that were called, for example, stuff like, you know, Manning or something like this, or, or you know, help, uh, help Iran or something like that, or Americans that care about Iran. And so be, be wary of the selection bias, one, and then two, recognize that there are sets of people who are really important, in my opinion, and in other people's opinions, who are starting to use Tor. So for example, journalists. A lot of journalists who barely know how to use a computer are booting tails these days. And I mean, like hundreds, maybe even thousands of them, because they know that if they want to talk to people, or if they want to have some kind of operational security, they need to have a security culture, and they also need to have these tools, and if they're not going to figure them out themselves, they at least will try these things. So one is not necessarily the same as another in that case. We've moved from 3,000 relays to 4,000 relays in the past five weeks. So 
there's quite a bit of activity. Now, a lot of these new volunteers are not enormous relays. So part of our challenge is how do we get people who work at ISPs or attend universities or other places that have lots of bandwidth to help contribute to the network. But as the network grows, it becomes able to handle more users. One of our challenges over the past many years is people say, I tried Tor, but I, I couldn't download my thing fast enough, so I gave up. Uh, and as the network grows and as we get better at research on performance, uh, we've gotten a lot better at that. Yep. And you get a t-shirt. Thank you for your question. Hi. Um, so my question is more for kind of first a question for the audience that maybe you guys can kind of comment on. Uh -oh. All right. <laughs> Who here is a, a graduate student? Is anyone here a graduate student? Uh, so, so somebody who you already have your, your first under degree and you're now you're doing research. People do research here? Anybody? Who what? Who has, who has a bachelor degree? Yeah? yeah. Lots of you guys. Okay, um, so there's been like these, these conversations in the privacy research community connected to the Tor community about how research and Tor can actually work together to make you know, practical good things happen. And there's been discussion about, um, you know, maybe there should be bounties. So if a graduate student does something, you know, comes up with an interesting theoretical result, if they, if they did a little bit more and made it practical, this would be, you know, then, then we'd pay you some money. Or maybe, you know, then they'd, they'd, you know, pay some money to have you fly to visit with the tour developers and work with them to make your, your thing real. Or, you know, or, or things like that. Is, is that the sort of thing that people here would think would, would, would affect you if, if you were doing research that was, that, was, that was along those lines? I'm just curious. And, um, cause you to do more of it, maybe be interested in working on those problems? Who here would like to work on the kinds of free software that we work on and the kinds of research that we work on? Raise your hand. Yeah. Who would like to make a living doing that, for example, or to get a degree doing that? Raise your hand. All of you, or raise your hand if you would think that. Okay. So that's the question that Rachel is asking. That, that's kind of what I'm asking is, is sort of... So come talk to her for a job. Uh, that, that's not quite what I said, but yeah. <laughs> you can have a t-shirt if you want. You can have two. We really do. So have you ever discovered anything that might be an attack on on the Tor technology itself, not a theoretically theoretical publication or a software bug, but someone running relays for traffic analysis purposes or anything interesting in that direction you can share. Well, I mean, it's security technology that is 10 years old now and supposedly it's success, uh, successful to some degree, so it probably attracts interest from attackers. and. It would be interesting to know what. So here's one. I think that's up there, right? Oh, no, projector's off. Oh, darn. Well, there's a great slide. <laughs> uh, the, the short version is, of course, right? The Tor network gets attacked all the time, and Tor clients have their path to the Tor network um, interfered with often. So for example, um, in September of, uh, I don't even know what year this is. 2009. 2009 um, was the 60th anniversary of some guy making China. He, not a historian, but um, he, you know, had an anniversary, let's say, or the country did. And basically, what we see is we had about 10,000 users, and the next day, September 25th or so, we had significantly less. And then we had a little bump in the number of clients that were, uh, is it working now? That, that were connecting. So that's a kind of attack on the Tor network, and it's a great example of how 10 years ago, we, and I even remember there might be a person in the audience who used to tease me about this, where um, we thought that it would be a really, really good idea if we had um, you know, some way to stop people from easily blocking Tor, like not having the string Tor, for example, in our, our handshaking process. Um, and so we sort of knew that this was gonna happen at some point, and ah, there we go. And that's an attack, right? Denial of service is an attack. But fascinating things, sometimes when we see these kinds of attacks, we don't notice all Tor usage dropping to zero. There are sometimes places where 
it's most of the country that can't use Tor, but then there's a small set of people. So I think there's a slide. Yeah, so yeah, this is a great slide, although you'll notice that it's kind of a hilarious uh, thing in terms of the numbers. So this is where China blocked Tor for the first time, which we sort of expected at some point. And of course, this is the number of people that use bridges basically the next day. <laughs> it tells you something also about our statistics in both cases, and that I guess we were off by a bit here and there. That first slide is just your relay. Yeah, exactly. The second slide is all of the clients that we could count at the time. And I, I'm happy to chat later about the research problem of how do you anonymously count, safely count, how many anonymous users you have. Uh, it, it turns out to be a pretty complex problem. And if you're interested in that, there's a man right in the front. If you could raise your hand, turn around, and wave like JFK. He, uh, he, um, he is actually the person that works on these metrics projects, which allow us to see by looking in a privacy-preserving way at who connects to different Tor relays what's happening. And so here we see some stuff in Iran where they are looking at the TLS handshake and they're looking at specific what we would call protocol distinguishers, so like a, a set of bytes or a field that has a particular interpretation which you can predict, which when you decide that any packet that has that is part of a connection or a stream of some kind of data, which you can tear down. And so that's what you see here, and those are attacks. And here in Egypt, I have a really kind of cute story about this, which is, do you guys remember when they pulled the plug in Egypt? It wasn't really the first internet plug being pulled, but people thought it was. And people also thought it was a Facebook and Twitter revolution because that's how they experienced it. Um, that's, of course, not actually how it is, but it's an important part. I was actually looking, let's say, at some of the Egyptian networks during the revolution, working with activists in Egypt um, for the Gen 25th, Gen 28th revolution. And now they're, of course, going through some more turmoil. And we didn't actually see that all Tor users had dropped to zero. And I noticed that through the Internet 2 network, that their intelligence service was actually still on the internet, but you couldn't see that they were genuinely routable unless you were on internet too, which was pretty awesome um, in that it tells you a little bit about how they were operating. Um, and it works pretty hard to learn more about that internet connection, but I didn't learn too much, except that I noticed that in some places it looked like there were still connections from those IP blocks. So everybody else lost their connection and then a few people had a backup and some of those people may have been using Tor. Interesting. I hope they were working for the revolution. And you see this here in Libya. You see this here in Syria. You see it again in Iran. Each of those red marks is a, what we would call a blocking event. And there's a whole analysis engine that's on metrics.tor project. This graphic is by George Denisis and Karsten. Um, so it's basically analyzing. So we don't actually even have to have a probe, although Arturo Filasto here, who can also wave, he runs the Uni project. Um, with Aaron and Isis, and they're working on a free software probe that is like human rights observation software, where then you can do data analysis and collection voluntarily to help us debug these kinds of things. Um, so these kinds of attacks are happening all the time. And if you're asking about cryptographic attacks and other things like that, that is an interesting question, and I don't really think that we know anything about specific cryptographic attacks, but obviously the RSA modulus that we use, that could be bigger. Um, we've recently changed to using some elliptic curve stuff that Dan Bernstein and Nick Mathewson have been working on, which is very powerful. Um, so we're upgrading parts of the crypto as we go along, as well as having pluggable transports so that these kinds of like super simple TCP resets or TLS client, um, you know, server closed messages, they, they're not useful for denial of service. So another question you might have been asking, you were talking more about the anonymity side, I think, than the censorship resistance side. So that has to do with the crypto that Jake brought up, but another version of this question that we hear a lot is, what about bad governments running relays? What if they run a bunch of relays? Couldn't they watch a, a lot of the Tor network? So there are, are a few pieces of background to, to learn here. Uh, so the Tor network is made up of three or 4,000 relays, but some of them are very fast and some of them are pretty slow, and we load balance. So it's actually more like 400 or 500 if you looked at it in a uniform way. So it's not like all 4,000 of them help as much as they could. Uh, so the, the challenge is how, there, there are two different versions of the attack. One of them is a bad guy runs a relay, and now there's a chance that you use that relay in your path. And if he runs enough relays, 
then eventually there's a pretty good chance that the first relay you pick is run by the bad guy, and a pretty good chance that the last relay you pick is run by the bad guy. And in that case, they can use traffic, what we call a traffic correlation or traffic confirmation attack. And there's an open research question about how easy this is in practice, but a lot of people think that it's pretty easy right now. So the, the main diversity goal of Tor in that respect is to have a lot of different relays so that the chance is low that the bad guy's relay will end up first and last in your circuit. So I had a, a big argument with Bruce Schneier about this long ago, because he was writing one of his blog posts, and he had the sentence, of course NSA runs Tor relays in his blog post. And I was thinking, of course NSA doesn't run Tor relays. They already have a deal with AT&T to watch AT&T. They already have a deal with Verizon. They already have a deal with whoever else they have a deal with. They're doing great at surveilling a lot of the internet. Other people who run relays run them on the network that NSA has already gotten a deal to watch. Why would they go through the red tape? I mean, if, if you've ever worked for a government, there's, al there's always somebody whose job is to say, no, you can't do that. It's actually hard for them to put services up on the internet. They've already gone through the process of surveilling lots of other things. There's nothing in it for them to run their own relays. It's only increasing the risk that somebody gets angry at them. And we can argue about whether they care or if anybody gets angry at them. Uh, but I, I don't think that that is a realistic attack, though I do worry about it, especially when uh, huge political events happen like the Iran thing and like the, the recent uh, Snowden stuff, we get a lot of relays. It, what would happen if, the, if some nation decided, uh, I'm gonna sneak in my relays at this point? So if somebody shows up with 400 new relays, we can say, hey, what just happened? But if they sneak them in while other people are getting excited, is there a difference between uh, 1,000 new volunteers and 500 new volunteers and 500 relays run by a nation? How do we figure out who's running the relays? The only answer we have right now is we need so many relays in so many different places that it really is difficult to become enough of the network to be able to break it. I think also um, I wanted to cover the other points first so that we had some relevant slides. But there exists in America a political prisoner by the name of Jeremy Hammond. And he is a great example of how Tor cannot solve all of the problems that he wanted. I, mean, I don't know what he wanted, but it seems to me like, in his case, he was talking to another person whose name is Sabu. He's sort of like Adrian Lamo from New York City. Um, and so he's, you know, not a great guy. He was an informant for the FBI. And what the FBI did is they drove to his house and they disconnected his internet and they waited to see if he dropped off IRC and then their informant said, yeah, he dropped off the internet. And that's a, that's a problem, right? But that's not just a Tor problem. Because even if he was using like some delay tolerant networks or something like that, he would be having the same trouble. He's working with people who ultimately, it's not just Tor, right? It was the fact that he worked with people who were working against him. So there's a whole security culture, and this is the holistic approach that, that I mentioned before that you have to think about. And as far as I know, that's the first time that's ever happened in the United States that is pretty problematic. And it sort of suggests that if you are worried about being targeted for things, that that's a legitimate concern and you should be careful about this kind of stuff. That isn't to say that Tor has a problem. It is to say that that method of organizing and compartmentalization might have a problem. Where Tor works best is when they don't already think of you. Exactly. They already have a list of people and they go to your house and they tap everything and they watch you connect to the Tor network, and they think they know what website you're gonna go to, so they're watching that also, and they're building a big database about everything. If they're already looking at you or thinking about you, this is gonna go bad for you. So a lot of these situations that we're talking about, Tor has not been the weakest link, something else has been the weakest link. But there, there is but, one caveat to that, which is to say, now let's talk about alternatives. So people will say, oh, use anonymizer, right? No, absolutely not. Use a VPN? No, absolutely not. The thing is that there really are not a, like a, a wide variety of options in this case, right? And that is a serious problem. And in the case of Hammond, I mean, you can argue whether or not you, know, you think that that was worth catching and that's a valid method or whatever. I'm, I'm not interested in really talking about that. But if we look at it this way, there is almost no tool that exists that way. But the communication protocols you might run over that tool, for example, those might 
be kind of interesting. So Adam Langley, for example, is working on a communications protocol called POND, which is an elliptic curve delay messaging system that's like email, but it has the properties of off the record messaging, so forward secrecy and so on, and it uses a server, and it uses some pretty cool group signature stuff, and we've developed a way to do a rendezvous with a shared secret that's pretty awesome, I think, and we're working on a paper about it. Something like that doesn't have the same problem with a traffic confirmation attack, as far as, far as I can tell. Um, it might, but that and Tor together would be much better. And of course, that and Tor are what you need. It does not work with a VPN because it requires Tor hidden services. So you really have to think about the big, big picture and all the things that are going on around it. You can't just think about the small part. And those attacks, uh, like the traffic confirmation attack against Jeremy Hammond, they're real, and that is, that is a problem. There are very few things that we think anything else would do better with, I think. There was a guy I was having a discussion with who runs a German website trying to provide recommendations about data retention and so on. And he wanted to put up the phrase, I recommend you stop using Tor, because when you use Tor, your connections are probably going to go over these internet exchange points that I just heard about last week, and therefore the bad guys are gonna be able to watch your traffic. And if you don't use Tor, then maybe you're just talking to a local website inside Germany and surely nobody would be watching that. Uh -huh. So uh, my first answer was, you know, just because you just heard one leak doesn't mean there won't be another one next week talking about what else the BND does. Uh, but the, 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 the real issue, he's both overestimating and underestimating. It, you shouldn't abandon Tor because your traffic will go over these backbones. Tor still provides more protection than nothing. At the same time, he's being really naive by saying, maybe these data collection points aren't gonna be able to see that I'm doing anything. Maybe they're in the wrong places. Shouldn't I just browse the web directly and then I'll be okay? And the problem with that is every time you go to Facebook, you actually go to 27 other places all around the internet and they're all very far away from Germany where they're collecting cookies and doing advertising and so on. So every time you do anything, you spread all of your communications out over the internet and you, you have to, if I were collecting this stuff, I would start at the ad servers. Because every time you go to double click or Google or whatever, you're going to every other website and you're telling these people who you are and where you're going and when you're going there. So that scares the hell out of me. If you stop using Tor, you're, you're a lot worse off. And there's an additional thing which is worth considering, which is, Yes, someone may be able to detect that you're using Tor, they may even interfere, they may try to do a traffic confirmation attack, but if you absolutely certainly will be known to have visited wikileaks.org, for example, from your house, that might be a serious problem. Whereas if you absolutely certainly use Tor and have no idea what you visited, well, there are like thousands and thousands of other people that did the same thing today, right? And you're going to hide in a set of users where the anonymity set is about using Tor, not about the thing you were definitely doing over Tor, right? That is, uh, I think, important from a uh, is that how you say it, spike it? However you store data, the data retention stuff. And the data retention stuff that people are talking about here in Germany, for example, it sounds a lot to me like the NSA stuff, by the way. Like it really does, right? You're talking about PRISM, like, right? That's what data retention is, it's big databases of that stuff. So what do you want in your data retention profile? And, and in this case, it's a little off base from your original question, but it's worth considering that when we think about these attacks, one of the attacks we have to think about is the things that happen when we don't use Tor at all. So you probably should start using Tor way before you actually need it so that it doesn't oh, come I have a, up. I have a great story for you. I used to work at Greenpeace International. My title was uh, Network Security Special Services, which is a really fantastic uh, job at Greenpeace. And I worked in San Francisco, and I worked in Amsterdam, and I did security stuff. So we dealt with the communication network for the, the Greenpeace Navy, if you will, and other things like that. And I said, oh, we need to start using PGP for our internal emails, and you know, we should really do this all the time, especially for important things on our internal network. And this really high up Dutch guy in the company who sometimes I wonder about him and other times I just think he's a bad guy. And he basically said, no, 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 we only use PGP right before we do an action, <laughs> when we have something to hide. And uh, it's really important that only when we commit a crime should we be using encryption. And I said, don't you think that that's a maybe 
bad operational thing. And he said, well, why? What's the problem? I mean, I don't have anything to hide the rest of the time. I'm just working at Greenpeace. It's not like we're targeted by anybody. And I said, didn't the French sink one of the Greenpeace ships and kill the photographer? And he said, well, I guess so, but that was a one-time event. And I said, well, didn't Duncan Campbell, didn't he show that Echelon was targeting Greenpeace? And he said, yeah, but that's just paranoid conspiracy garbage. And I said, oh, okay, cool, oh, interesting. Didn't you just write me an email about going to a cafe in Amsterdam? Hmm, well, you know, I live in America, so you're asking me to commit a crime via email, and you didn't even realize you were doing that because you're living in Amsterdam. Couldn't convince him, which is why I'm pretty sure about him. But that is a great example of how you really need to think ahead. And if you think you'll always be exempt and you'll always have privilege, you might be wrong. So hedge your bets on that one. Okay, thanks. Thanks, you get a shirt. We should try to go through our questions quicker. Yeah, we should. Actually, can we have a show of hands? Who here is totally tired? Who wants to stop? Okay, this is awful. Who wants to keep going? Raise your hand. Do you guys want a break where you shake you get yourself to be alive and awake just for a minute? I'm not going to prance. Cards Against Humanity, not on stage. Um, hey, uh, I have one, to have one quick point which I want to start off, which is I very much agree with the point uh, Jake you made about policy. Because the brief, ge brief geheimness which uh, you were mentioning earlier is actually a sort of a uh, well, younger historical achievement, when the f sort of mail system was first introduced in Germany, the way they tendered it out was for somebody to have the dual role to um, transport all the mail and to su do complete surveillance of all of it. So, um, as it turns out, well, at the beginning, in this case, the technology, the mail, and the surveillance and censorship were sort of intertwined. So, we've come a long way from that, and that's because of policy. But on the other hand, well, maybe we How'd that work out, though? Just the policy of uh, briefs geheims in... Yeah, in, well, in I would say that's policy, right? Or it, so it is policy, and, and it is good, and I think it's totally fantastic, and Benjamin Franklin in the United States thought the same. Uh, but the question I guess I would ask is, what are some of the... Sorry to ask you this question, but if you like policy, can you torpedo the policy for a moment by just talking about how policy alone hasn't worked out so well for secrecy of letters in Germany, for example? Well, I'm sure there's some surveillance uh, still going on in any Historically? Case. Oh, historically? Well, uh, obviously. Um, I, I don't know how the law situation was uh, during fascism, but uh, I would assume... Oh, and of course you have the GDR, which was, of course, a huge That's what example. I was thinking. And I don't know what the law actually was over there, but probably it said, you know, all your mail is safe. Uh, but what I wanted to... The point or question I wanted to ask is that, um, looking back at this, uh, at the moment, we have something which is really unprecedented in history, is that we, as individuals, actually have the tools of enforcing pretty good anonymity and security just through, well, the wonderful world of cryptography. Uh, and it, this is something which has been really unprecedented, of course. So at the moment, through PGP, through other tools, we would have the chance to hide most of our communication from government, but we choose not to. Well, I'm not sure. I think well, that to I mean, say that we'd make that choice is to suggest there's informed consent about all these things and that people understand those technologies. And in a computer science department, just a quick survey, who here uses PGP every day? Okay. Who here knows about PGP? Who here chooses not to use it every time they send an email consciously? Okay. So that's a lot different than I think what you just said. Maybe I'm oh, a little bit I wrong, think but the sample isn't really representative. It's representative of this yeah. this this talk right now, which is obviously not great. But if we if we if we look at the big picture, fewer people in German society and around the world, for example, even know what the hell we're talking about right now. Yeah. Even well, when we talk about the secrecy of the post, by the way. Yeah. Well, still, I do feel you know just talking to my non not as much geeky friends. Um, the biggest enemy of security in those cases does seem to be laziness. And I remember being, you know, all gung-ho about PGP like 12, 13 years ago, trying to convince everybody to uh, use it, and I failed, right? I mean, um, and so the question to you would be, how do you convince people 
to use PGP or G GPG or whatever other means of privacy they are and overcome their laziness and their arguments, well, I just lost your key again, sorry, and all this stuff, which is a, it just seems to be the hassle for most people is too big to use these tools, which is a shame. How do you convince them? From the Tor perspective, I used to actually worry about this problem. I used to say, how do I get people to care about using Tor? And then there were front page newspaper articles about all sorts of corporations that collect data and lose it, and governments that surveil people. And then we had more and more users. My problem now is, how do I make a Tor network that can handle all the users who want to use it? My problem is not, how do I get everybody to, to notice these things? My problem is, how do I keep up with the people who want it? So from my perspective, we're doing pretty well. We have a, a slide that Jake skipped over where we have maybe 500,000 daily users. So those are active people using it daily. We had 40 million downloads last year. There are a lot of people who have Tor, sometimes they use it. If we can make it technically better, they'll use it more often. I mean, also there are some things like Werner Koch, who uh, works on uh, GNU PG, for example. He has this proposal called Steed, which is for automatically doing GNU PG email. And I think, you know, something like that is something we should see, wouldn't it be great if Germany said, if you want to run email in this country, it's not just about data retention, it's also about data security. You have to actually provide secure email, right? That's a great policy, I can imagine, but it could also backfire pretty badly because they might ask for key escrow, for example. So you have to resist that. Another thing to consider is the mode of communication. It's super hard to get people to use PGP because they have to know a lot of stuff. Off the record messaging by Ian Goldberg, for example, I'm one of the maintainers of OTR these days, but he's the one that obviously created it and did everything, right? That teaches us that when you have an intention of chatting with instant messaging, automatically OTR sets it up. Now the security you get from that is either if there's no active man in the middle attack or if you verify it to make sure there isn't one, that's actually really great for opportunistic protection of data and it works really well. And pretty much anyone you instant message with, if they run a chat client, they get that. And the reason is because it's usable and the protocol allows for it really easily and the underlying protocols that go along with it, those also have different layers of security. And also, any of the speed concerns that might go along with it or any of the asking for a key or anything like that, they just kind of happen automatically or they're not really too important because the latency, for example, if you were to use instant messaging like Jabber along with OTR along with Tor, you know, 100 milliseconds difference doesn't make a big difference. So I would definitely say we should start by not insulting them and calling them lazy. And I would follow up by saying we should build tools so that solve people's real problems and we should refuse to backdoor them and it should be usable and it should be free and open software. And when we do that, and policy supports people doing that, funding Christian's research, for example, when they, policymakers in the EU or in Germany say, hey, we want real security that coincides with our policy, that will make a huge difference for everybody. And you can do stuff like use Red Phone or Tech Secure, and I, I know a lot of people that do if they have a cell phone. But it, as you probably, have any of you ever heard of a politician by the name of Malte Spitz? Some of you may have. He did, uh, he did, uh, uh, some kind of lawsuit and got the data for, I think it was telecom, that showed where he was going and then mapped it out. So there are different kinds of privacy. I wouldn't say that people who have cell phones don't care about location privacy, but what are they going to do if they also need a cell phone? We have to have usable alternatives that are really usable, not just by specialized knowledge, that are really usable and when that happens, then maybe we can tell them that they're lazy. But it's super hard to not have a cell phone in the modern world, which means you're going to have a proprietary baseband that can spy on you and FinFisher located near here. Those people will be able to probably backdoor it and the Staatsschuljan, that's a problem as well. And it's not that people are lazy that those problems exist. Right? It is really the fact that we need alternatives and we need to build them and a lot of them don't exist. And the few that do are specialized. So help us with the policy angle, especially in Germany, where the Grundgesetz is really good and respects, I mean, it's amazing, right? Your constitution really respects individuals' privacy. And the Verfassungsgericht has talked about the core of your life in the computer and in the phone. So there's good legal basis for this. But as we know from Der Spiegel, what we think is the case with law may not actually be the case with the law. 
So policy alone won't be enough. You get a shirt. I don't know that you'll wear it. You look like you might not. But. <laughs> At least on laundry day, you know? I guess, uh, thank you for uh, developing Tor and uh, helping us pr protect our privacy. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, usage of Tor. Do you have some estimates or statistics how the Tor network is used, how, mu how much of it is, let's say, to protect privacy of uh, people that might have problems with the governments, some illegal stuff? Do you have any information on that? No. I think is the short answer. It's an anonymity network, and we've designed it so that we don't know those things. But metrics.torproject.org shows privacy-preserving statistics, and other academics have written about some of those things, and most of those papers are garbage. He wouldn't say that, but I'll say it. What's your second question? Uh, the second question is more technical. I, was, I really wanted to uh, run a Tor relay, but unfortunately I, was not, uh, I didn't have a public IP address, and this is the requirement for a public uh, relay. So why is it not, I mean, uh, what's the reason why it's not possible to, to use a IP, uh, to like use a computer behind a firewall or some network uh, address? Are you able to do NAT piercing or anything like that or no, nothing? Unfortunately, no. So uh, the question is, it, is it a technical problem that uh, it's difficult to implement or it's maybe some... But you're not really on the design, internet. Design, That's design, design problem that it decreases the privacy yeah, so there are, there are several problems, but one of them is that if you're not generally reachable and you have to use a third party to reach you, sure, you have for example, sandwich, sandwich it with, uh, then you might as well just use the third party. That's at least the idea. I actually don't agree with that assessment. Um, and Christian has written a really good paper about how to do this kind of nat traversal stuff, and I think we could do, do better. So actually, if you want to contact us so that we can try to use some of those techniques to grow the network, we could experiment. But generally speaking, if you have to trust a third party, you you're already dealing with this third party. So that makes it hard. And the Tor network is designed such that every relay needs to reach every other relay. So that creates some, you know, that creates some problems. And you, you need to be able to do that for the current design of the network. There may be ways to make that happen with things like NAT Pwn and uh, UPnP and NATPnP or some other stuff. But at the moment, that's why it is that way. You need to actually be on the real internet and be end-to-end -end reachable. One of the biggest barriers is actually the anonymity analysis. Right now we say there are 4,000 relays, they can all reach each other, so the client will pull down the list and be able to build a path, and any possible path is possible. And once we start saying there are actually 1,000 relays like this, and 2,000 like this, and 1,000 like that, and this path is not possible, but this path is, then the analysis of what's the chance that you build a path that ends up being vulnerable to an attacker gets a lot more complex. We're already, uh, it's already hard enough given a clique topology, a topology where all the relays can reach each other, to analyze what's going on. So it's not so much an engineering question as a, I don't know what the heck that would do question. One thing, if you run a TAR node behind a network address translator, normally the network address translator software breaks because the number of different flows going from and to your node will just break the nut. That's only for crummy, misconfigured nets. Get a better one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, not, not all of them, but almost all of the ones you can get. Okay. What? Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. So torservers.net, if you are interested in helping, um, you don't have to run the relay at your house. You could also donate bitcoins, US dollars, euros, slotties, whatever you want. And uh, they actually run a whole bunch of exit relays and middle relays and they're really good at it, and they run them all over the world, and they properly tell the network that they are related, so it doesn't harm the anonymity as it builds the capacity. And I think this is actually a really nice way to non-technically support, and it actually puts a figure on, on what you're willing to do. Not everybody has extra cash, though, so you could also contact us and show us the NAT you're behind, and maybe there's some cool tricks we could do, which could be interesting, that don't give Roger the heebie-jeebies, and... Uh, don't uh, cause problems in other One ways. One trick that I would like to do, there are some people out there who can be exit relays, but they can't have a public IP. So maybe we should pair up some public relay with an exit so that you exit through the, the fellow who is able to be an exit relay. But going back to, to Jake's point about torservers.net, there's a, a German organization 
Also, the CCC runs a bunch of exit relays as a nonprofit. There's a Swedish organization. There's a Dutch organization as of two days ago. There's a French organization from the fellow up there. Uh, so there are a growing number of nonprofits whose goal is not only run a bunch of exit relays, but also change the politics and the culture of the country they're in to make it more socially acceptable. So there, there's a guy with blue hair here. I'm just pointing out and de-anonymizing all these folks, sorry. Um, he is one of the founders of Noisebridge, and he a uh, totally great guy, and he also is a part of a thing called Noise Tour, which is a, an American organization for running relays. And then this nice guy with the black glasses next to him, he runs DFRI with a bunch of other people, and they do the same thing in Sweden. And so if you're really interested, you might also be able to just help them with anything that they're doing, and that actually really helps the Tor network in a big way. And some of these groups also run bridges, not just relays, to help people who need access to the internet who are otherwise censored, which is great. Because when we do that, that's a problem. We don't want that information. We want a diverse community that helps provide for the whole community. And amazingly, some of these things are becoming self-sustaining in, in good ways. And that is very, very important. And the more we are removed from that process, the better that it is. You might also just call your ISP and get a public IP. All right, thanks. Yep. You should, uh, you should come into the line. Sorry. Okay, so hi. Uh, my question is, um, do you think, or how, how do you think um, the recent events in our world would be different if um, Romney has, would won the last election, and um, would they be different at all? This is fantastic, it's a short question. <laughs> short answer. I've got a second question too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, as I said before, there are a bunch of lawless individuals, and, well, I think Obama is one of them, and that's my personal opinion, not a Tor Project opinion in any way whatsoever. It's clearly the case that when people lie to Congress, like Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence, or when General Alexander, the head of the National Security Agency, talks about this, that there is a systemic problem with a bunch of perjuring criminals in the U.S. government, and whoever's at the top of that is also part of the problem, but it's not the only problem. And in fact, the bigger problem is when the military militarizes the internet and then uses it in support of militarization and occupation of the world. So what's the difference? Bag of shit, bag of shit. Oh, I'm not sure. What's your second question? Okay, the second question is um, because I believe that um, most people use Tor to communicate with each other. So um, will we see some development soon that um, makes this easier, better latency or some kind of real-time voice over IP communication Skype with really hard encryption and strong privacy? Or just chat? Something better than IRC? So wait, do, you, do, do I understand your question? You're saying, how do we make it faster? Is one part. And then second, there are specific applications you want to see. When will we see those specifics? You know, around one, when will we see some uh, something that enables people to talk really um, real-time conversation or at least chat with three or four I'm seconds troll. delay. Feel free to troll. All right, I'll prepare to be trolled. It already is possible to do this. Uh, things like Jitsi, for example, and Mumble, you can do voice communications and it could use some work. And in fact, if you use these things and you find that they don't work very well, it would be great to have your help. So the trolling part is, uh, are you a programmer? Do you work on these things? Do you want a summer job? <laughs> Do you want to help scope the problem so that we can work on it? We can't solve every problem, but there are other tools out there that are trying to do these things, and when combined with Tor, they might work pretty well. And then I suppose the answer to the first part of your question is, how fast do you want to die in some cases? And that's actually not trolling, right? If you're using Tor in Syria, and you weaken the anonymity properties somehow so that you can have 100 milliseconds of latency instead of 150. I mean, I know that that's a dream, but it happens from time to time. How fast do you want to die, right? Because the consequences of your action are very contextual. And so sometimes the right answer might be to use something like mumble, which is basically half duplex voice, so you can have those conversations. And the cost is you don't get all the niceties of Skype. On the other side, prism, right? 
try two other answers. Yeah. So one answer, uh, the people who work on Orbot, which is Tor for Android, have been working on a push to talk application. So it's, you actually hear voices, you hold down the record, you say your thing, turns it into an MP3, the MP3 works its way through the Tor network, it plays on the other side. You have to get used to one to two second latency between what people are saying, but a lot of people are making use of this and can get used to that. It isn't something they've rolled out a lot yet, but I think it would be uh, a really useful alternative uh, if we don't have great uh, low latency in the network. The other answer is there are a lot of interesting research papers on how to provide priority to streams that don't have as many bytes on them. And a lot of those have really confusing anonymity implications at this point that we're still working on, but I think we're making a lot of progress towards being able to do something like that. A third answer is the more capacity we have on the network, the faster it gets. A few years ago, you couldn't use Mumble and VoIP. It just wouldn't work. Now it does if you're patient. We're getting there. And there's, an, there's and another it product. It's called OSTEL, and it's by the Guardian Project people. I'm not pulling it up there. I was just looking at it over here. And this is actually something which, you know, the same people from the Guardian Project are working on this, and they're trying to make a totally free, open, forward secret encrypted phone system without backdoors that isn't really a phone system, right? The intention is to talk to each other, so let's stop talking about phones, because that's the group and community of people that screwed everyone over and put us in this position, the International Telecommunications Union, right? They like secretly backdoor things and, and not so secretly do it at the same time and wiretap and so on. These people want to make the equivalent and basically make it open. And there is, in fact, a free open version of OS Tel, which is what they've created, and it's like Skype. Coupling it with Tor should be possible, and you don't have this half duplex thing, and that works right now on an Android phone. There are trade-offs though, right? If you're using Android and you're tied to Google, what have you done? What privacy have you gained? It's not totally clear yet, but in this case, those things work, sort of, or they exist mostly, and we could use some help with them. So if this is something you really care about, you're not the first, but you might be the first that really helps those people to do this from this university, or at all, actually. Do you think there is a way to make some money with it because this would accelerate things, I, I think? Do you mean, can you get paid to work on the software? No, create a service which uh, produces revenue like Skype. Yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine that there is definitely the possibility for something like that. And I think we have to have viable economic models. If we want to have viable secure communications means that traverse the entire planet in uh, you know, short amounts of time. And you see that people are willing to pay for phone calls, but there are some privacy concerns that we have about that, right? Because well, look what happened with the phone network. If you're one of the 20 people who pay for the better service and some anonymous person is getting better service, I wonder who it is. So part of the challenge with Tor is to make all the users blend together and there's no way to tell whether that's a person who paid for better service or not. Yeah, and sustainability is key, right? Tor has sustainability through mutual aid, essentially, right? Tor users run Tor relays and that helps sustain the network. That has problems. Right? Because if everybody stopped running relays, it could cause problems for the network and its capacity. And as he says, as the capacity of the network grows, then so too will what we can do reliably over it in a usable way. So part of the solution is helping Nathan and Co at uh, Guardian Project, and then the other part is actually making the network able to support that kind of intentional usage in a way that people are happy with. Uh, and both of those need sustainable economic models. Tor, I think, has one to a degree, it's pretty good. I'm not so sure about the voice service that goes on top, but if it's truly peer-to-peer, -peer, you might be able to get by with the sustainable, sustainable uh, model that Tor has developed. So come hack with us. You get a shirt too. Um, well, I'm referring to a gentleman uh, who spoke before who asked, uh, why should I actually care about Tor? Why should I use it? Oh, he's right there. He's two people behind you with yeah. the blue shirt. Um, the, the thing you mentioned that um, if, if um, you get, uh, if you make some communication and you try to overthrow a government in uh, Southeast whatever land, um, and then afterwards, and you don't know uh, if they stuck it up for you or not, and they afterwards want to get you and they get that information, um, isn't it that if they really want to get you, if, they, if you're really on the radar and to be honest, 
to, to get on the radar is not that hard, I assume. Um, if they really want to get you, uh, I mean, what stops them from making up things? We've seen that one or two times before. Well, um, I feel like I'm uniquely qualified to answer this question. I was going to go with, we do. If that's, we don't solve it, who's going to? That's the, that's the answer to the, to the latter half. But the beginning point here is wh wh what else are you going to do? Right? And, and if you look at it, there are people who are plenty on the radar. And I don't just mean the drone radar. Right? There are plenty of people that are on radar. And what has happened with those people? Some of those people are still free. Some of those people are under threat. And using Tor at least makes it significantly harder, I think, for those things to be linked with everything else you're already on the radar for. You know, Banksy made a great joke, which I think is actually very optimistic. He said in the future that anonymity, everyone will be anonymous for 15 minutes, which is uh, very optimistic. And I think that that, that is you know, important to consider. If we don't have free societies, though, of course, data retention allows for evidence fabrication without willfully massaging the data necessarily or adding new stuff to misrepresent situations that exist. This is the concept of the data doppelganger, where your data becomes your truth, right? So you say, I'm not interested in communism. And they say, we looked at you reading the Wikipedia. You read every article relating to communism. And you said, yeah, yeah, that's why I am not a communist. And then they say, no, this is proof that you are. And, and so in this case, using Tor is going to help. And if they wanted to target you for other things before, at least they'll have a little bit less ammo, except for that you're using Tor. But you may still be better off, especially if in a harm reduction model, you're going to keep doing that kind of stuff. Um, and there is another thing. Um, in Germany, I, I would really love to, to have one or two exit nodes. Um, for me at home, or I, I would really love to have them. Um, but for me in Germany, there's a real problem with the police uh, trying to kick in with uh, my door, and I really love my door. Um, how, you, mentioned, you mentioned some people in Germany running uh, exit nodes in Germany. So I think that many people here are interested. How do they do that? How did they, do you happen to know how they, politically, uh, how they manage to be um, waterproof against the law? I mean, because... It's, not that, they're, I mean, it's not that they're bulletproof against the law, it's that a lot of people I know, they went and talked to their local police and actually taught them to use Tor and then didn't do anything else with them, but just said, just so you know, I run Tor. If you see my IP address, it's a Tor relay. I'm helping Germans abroad to be secure against uh, economic espionage when they travel to China. For example, literally that's something someone has told the local police station that I have talked with them about. Those kinds of things happen. Also, people in the Chaos Computer Club, who here has heard of the CCC? Anybody? Raise your hand. Great, okay, so the CCC runs some exit nodes. They, while Holland runs some, Tor servers run some, they, they did things so that they are ready to respond to legal complaints that might come in. They're able to answer the phone to, to talk to these people. They're able to talk to them in a way which is not adversarial. They don't register their home address necessarily with their IP address so that it isn't their house that gets the visit, it might be their ISP. There's lots of things like that. We can talk about it later. And there's an email list you can mail, which is called tor-relays at list.torproject.org or tor-relays at list.torproject.org. If you want to, you can ask that question there. And there are tons of German relay operators that would love to help you out with that. And depending on which region of the country you live in, it might be a better or a worse idea. And for example, if you're a student, are you a student at this university? Are you at another Not, not at this one. I'm at uh, LMU. So I would encourage you to consider running a middle relay at your university and registering it to your department, for example, and then talking with your university about it and really getting, getting permission to do it if you need permission to do it. Otherwise, ask for forgiveness later. And, <laughs> and, and, and consider doing it this way, because if educational institutions are not the place for free speech and uh, for reading, what are they? And so Germany seems to be a place where that is something that happens. So I would really encourage you to, to do it there first. Also, that will make it probably a little bit cheaper for you personally. And you'll get to see about another important lesson in life, which is bureaucracy, which is amazing in Germany. <laughs> so. Speaking of hacking on Tor, one thing that we forgot to mention 
On Friday is a public Hackfest day where a lot of tour developers will be here at this university and we'd love to have you drop by and say what can I help program or what can I help debug or what can I help test. Uh, and Christian, can you tell us where this place is? LRZ next door. Did that make sense to those of you who know where we are? Great. So come hack with us. And if you don't want to hack on tour, but you're interested in coming just to talk about these kinds of things in general, maybe don't interrupt those that are deep in hacking. But on the other hand, please feel free to come and work on whatever it is you're working on and join our community. Because our community is about free communication, open communication, right? That means whatever app you're building, if it doesn't currently include the ability to resist censorship or to thwart certain kinds of surveillance, maybe we can integrate Tor with that thing that you're doing. And that could be quite useful. And there will be a lot of relay operators there. So if you show up and say, I want to run a relay, please help me, you'll get a lot of attention. And you get a shirt. Um, there is another question oh. I wanted to ask you about because I didn't, sorry. Um, I just want to hear your opinion about it. I will pass the mic directly uh, forward. Um, I read uh, some while ago a French paper claiming that most nodes run on node, uh, uh, run on Tor, are um, um, let's say compromisable. Ah, uh, you're talking about Eric Filia Lulz, right? I, I don't know how to pronounce French. No idea French what the author was. I just, I just read that they say, well, basically, if you really want to take over Tor, you can by hacking all those relays and. That, that guy was quite something. That guy doesn't understand how Tor works and didn't okay. understand after I talked to him for a long time. The CCC people that I talked to who accepted that paper at 28C3 or whatever it was, uh, they were embarrassed and ashamed and regret accepting it. Uh, I talked to his grad student, though, who's a really nice guy and yeah. is trying to be a grad student somewhere else now with a researcher who actually understands what he's researching. Oh, or how did design an experiment. So the, the main problem with uh, Eric Filial's uh, worries, he looked at the set of 3,000 Tor relays. He said, obviously, they are all equal bandwidth and therefore equally likely to be chosen. I found these 400 that are running on Windows. Therefore, I can break into 400 out of 3,000, and that the numbers work out to be pretty bad. The problem is he picked the Windows ones, which are tiny and I would say, I, I don't want to say irrelevant, but with respect to attacking the network this way, they are irrelevant. So he, he, he had numbers like, I can attack 20% of the network and then I can break Tor, but what he really should have said was, I can attack 0.05% of the network and then I have a 0.08% chance of, of breaking Tor. This is not as cool as he thought it would be. Then he went to the French military and said, dear French military, May I have permission to break into computers all around the world? I don't know how the French military answered him, but why was he asking them? I encouraged him to break into one of my tour relays so that he could, you know, prove his point, and he declined by never doing it successfully. So an interesting point he also did is he dropped the incredible zero-day exploit of TCP reset. For those of you that are familiar with TCP IP, he said Tor is vulnerable because you can tear down the TCP connection between the Tor client and the Tor guard node by sending an unauthenticated TCP reset. So basically what he said was, I have never read a single paper about Tor. I'm full of shit. <laughs> and now I'm gonna hype a bunch of garbage and spread a bunch of FUD. And he's a lot like the guy in Sweden who did that as well, who said, I hacked the whole internet. Okay, I hacked the Tor network. Okay, actually I just ran an exit relay and I sniffed it. And yeah, actually I don't understand that sometimes people want to pivot from a local network which has absolute targeted surveillance on those people to an anonymity network because I need to use a site which is necessary for me. That guy, for example, and Eric have quite a lot in common in my opinion and they do a lot of damage when they talk about these things because they don't really understand and they are also I think, wasting a lot of our time. At the same time, there are actually really good researchers coming up with really good attacks against Tor, and there's a huge research community on how to assess how bad they are and how to fix them and how to decide when we fixed them. So it's, it's really sad that the folks with the most useless attacks are the ones who spend most of their time talking to the media. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure personally he's a really great guy, and I, I think it reflects badly for me to say that he's full of shit. 
Oh, there we go. All right, great. But nonetheless, nonetheless, I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I think part of the problem is that you know, cryptographic and anonymity related protocols are, are hard. And so sometimes people think they understand stuff. And in this, re in this respect, we really hope that people will coordinate things with us in that if he had emailed us and said, hey, I have this totally badass attack and I want to present it and we'd like a tour person on stage to explain it with us, you know, or something like that, it would be great. We would love to work with people like that, especially to explain to him that he doesn't know what he's talking about and he missed some stuff. The thing is though, it may be the case that he didn't care and he also wanted to you know, hype a lot of stuff. So your mileage may vary. Um, there are always people that are gonna hype this kind of stuff and in some cases they have done some cool stuff. Like Christian, I met him in Brazil and he basically is, the, as far as I know, the first person that almost, that almost broke Tor when he was doing some pretty interesting attacks against it and he contacted Roger and he did you know, the right thing. He coordinated and did some really cool research and then we ended up meeting by giving a kind of adversarial talk together, which was super stressful because he's a really, really ah, loud, you know, big bear on stage. And, um, and I mean that in the most loving way as a man from San Francisco, but uh, I, I, or maybe not, I don't know. But, uh, uh oh, what have I done? But, um, you know, we encourage people to break our stuff and we give respect when it's due. And if Eric was more like Christian Ruthoff here, I think we would be a lot happier with him. And that other guy in Sweden, which I lovingly refer to as shithead, because I can't remember another name that evokes the same feeling. Um, these things are not helpful, and they actually put people who don't understand this stuff in harm's way, and those people are like, well, the best thing I should do is just bear back with the internet. But when you bear back with the internet, you bear back with Big Brother. So it is much better, almost certainly, to use Tor in those situations. Yeah, you're welcome. So maybe we should do a quick survey. Everybody want to keep going? This is a marathon. Raise your hand if you want to stop. OK, get out. <laughs> Just you guys. Everybody else want to keep going? Raise your hand. Wow, this is incredible. It's a marathon. Do you want some mate? I don't think I'd be standing without it. OK, I'll, 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 make, it, I'll make my question very short. Uh, okay. First of all, full disclosure. Uh, my name is Jan Wildeboer. I work for an open source company called Red Hat, uh, which is an American company, and uh, the NSA is one of our customers, as you all know, and la di da di da di. Uh, I'm the EMEA evangelist for Red Hat, and uh, I want to officially, in the open here publicly, uh, offer to get abused uh, to promote Tor and everything possible inside Red Hat, and using my network to do that. And uh, so, you know, can I have a talk afterwards? If, if we would needed. love it if you would fix your OpenSSL to have elliptic curves. For example, that's really important. Uh, the, Another thing would be to ship lib, lib, the, lib OTR and Tor by default. That's a, legal, that's a legal problem and not a technical problem, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, the legal department has worked it out, but most of the your security team... The legal department is six years into finding out if they have an opinion or not. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> so. so it'd be great if you could fix that, though, because if you want people to have real security, you need to... Yeah, you need to have some, some support for modern cryptographic libraries because Tor requires elliptic curves for NTOR related stuff. Maybe that would mean you don't want to ship Tor, I don't know. But you should look into this stuff, and if it's possible, please do try to ship Tor by default in what you're doing. We would love to see that. In Fedora, it shouldn't be a problem because it's there anyway. Uh, in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it's a different story yep. uh, for a lot of reasons. So you know, it doesn't help. But the main thing I wanted to say is, uh, as we said about, you know, defending yourself in a digital world, the good thing here in Germany is that our local idiot of internal affairs, uh, sorry, minister of internal affairs, uh, in Innenminister Friedrich, has effectively just said uh, that uh, law enforcement, etc., should give up on, on, on wiretapping and etc. And it's more or less a citizen task to protect yourself. So you have one of the biggest proponents of promoting Tor here in Germany right at the government, which is a very good thing, I think. Yeah, I was, I was on the Maybrit uh, Illner show uh, about two weeks ago with the uh, um, Minister for the Interior of Bavaria and the uh, previous intelligence coordinator for the BND, and I had this discussion with them on that show. I mean, unfortunately, they didn't let me speak German. They made me speak in English and then translated me and got a bunch of stuff wrong. But, um, you know, I found it to be really awesome that these guys are willing to have these discussions. So as soon as you can convince them they're not on top of the world, and that they need this protection too. Most of these guys, even if they're not so sophisticated, at least understand that argument. And if they're concerned about China hacking them, 
which they all often seem to be, um, then they would obviously need to be concerned about total surveillance from other states as well as China at the same time. And building actually secure things is much better than building policies that result in tons of incredibly bad stuff actually occurring. I have two questions. Uh, first, thank you for this excellent talk. Um, question zero uh, regarding, <laughs> sorry, I really wanted to use that one. Um, We've got the new Bill Hicks. Uh, regarding actually adoption of this, um, I really heard lots of voices from lots of law-abiding people who actually don't want to believe what you just said, mm -hmm. who don't want to believe what's actually happening. Uh, but when I work in medical imaging and when I give them a form to actually use pictures I take of them or their scans and to use in publications, they are shaking and oh my god, don't show pictures of me in public or anything. But they have no idea that everything they're doing on the internet is actually public mm -hmm. and everybody collects it. Uh, my question is, how can you actually stem this flow of people who don't care or don't actually are, are not informed about what actually is going on? Oh man, I feel like we sort of already answered this, but I guess what I would say, if I may just be quick, because there are some other people, is that people do care, they don't understand, and there's a public education issue that exists here, and it's a generational one. Old people die, there's the good news. <laughs> okay, the bad news is it's up to you to make the next generation not have, oh sweet Jesus, thank you. Uh, it's a marathon here. Um, I lost my train of thought when this goodness arrived. It's okay, it's okay. Let me just start again by saying, old people die, that's the good news. It's also totally sad and terrible. You can try and spend a lot of time really working hard to educate them, and I think you should. But what you really need to do is own people in a good way, in a consensual way that demonstrates it and shows it. So for example, when you go and you show your representative GSM is horribly broken, and that with $30 worth of hardware, or $30, $23 worth of hardware, or 23 euros worth of hardware, um, you will be able to intercept calls, and you say, so why am I vulnerable? Why does the German government allow me to be vulnerable in this way? What happens when I travel abroad? I want to run a company. This puts me at risk for economic espionage. When you show them those things, and they can't deny it, and they have to justify it, some of those people, like, you know, the hamster wheel starts going, and they really recognize that if you're out of the country, even if it is your job to protect yourself, they have certain regulations that put you in harm's way, and they have to justify them. And, you know, maybe, for example, when you talk about medical imaging, you give them a pamphlet for a talk where I curse a little less, or where Roger is speaking, because he basically never does that, uh, curse, I mean, um, then that would probably help. And that will really raise the consciousness, because that's what we need, is a consciousness raising thing, right? Like, just like feminism was the radical notion that women are people too, we need the same consciousness raising about internet surveillance and the fact that even if you trust your state entirely, it's not up to your state whether or not you are spied on. And that the results of that will only be used in accordance with the German constitution. And people really actually do care about it if you don't use techno babble to mystify them and ruin it for them. So maybe try to use accessible language when you do that, and maybe we could be better about that. This is not a talk that is meant to be accessible to the whole world in this regard, because most of you that raised your hand already knew about Tor and you understood it, right? So this is, maybe the political components are a little bit more accessible, I don't know. Maybe they're crazy. But uh, if you want to help with that, we'd love your help. And we, in our community, love to reach out, especially to domestic violence organizations because people in domestic violence situations really understand location anonymity, for example. They really get that if you are a person who has been battered and your, you know, your abuser is going to come after you, you understand the value of keeping your location secret. And you know that if this tool was not available to you, you would be physically harmed by someone. There are lots of situations that are like that. And so finding those people in your community and reaching out to them is really, really powerful. And if you need help doing that, or with a message to do that, we'd love to help you with that. And you should come to our hack day on Friday, and we can help with that. Uh, 10 a.m. is when I'm getting here, and Christian students are giving talks starting at 11 a.m. And no, no. Oh, never mind. I'll be here at 10 a.m. Forget about his students. 
And my second question is, you oh. mentioned earlier about Mozilla and that there's some friction there. And I wanted to ask because it almost sounded like a match made in heaven that you actually get Tor bundled with Firefox. And now I understood that it's not that case. Hey, Mike, are you still here? Or did you also abandon ship? You went to get some mate. OK. So I work on another project. It's called Tor Birdie. It's a plugin. Who here uses Thunderbird? Great. So you are more users than I think my software has ever had. Um, but Sukhbar Singh and I have been working on it. It's a plugin for Thunderbird. And it makes it so that Thunderbird's weak crypto is disabled. And everything goes over Tor by default. And it makes it so you get location privacy when you use email. And it fails closed. So on the offhand chance that you have a mail server that isn't secure, you will have an error and you won't be able to check your mail and put yourself in harm's way. So it's what we would call contextual security. We have two patches that are outstanding that actually reduce the fingerprintability of individual clients. And Mozilla has not really been too interested in fixing those privacy things, but we have a lot of work to do on that. And that, that is ours when we need to do that work. For Mike Perry, he's making changes that are easy to maintain that are not necessarily things that the Mozilla group don't agree with, but it is often the case that the way we made those changes is not acceptable for long-term maintenance in their view. And then in other cases, we actually care more about the privacy of the user in a particular way, and we have different relationships with different groups than they do. And that isn't to speak badly of Mozilla. Mozilla is one of the best organizations in the world about this, I think. But at the same time, their threat model is not the same as Tor's threat model. And that makes a huge, huge impact on the way that we do these things and the, the values that we have. And that guy is from Mozilla, I suspect, which is why he has a Microsoft. Uh, can you specify which component is affected by uh, the fingerprinting issue? Is it the Thunderbird itself, or is it related to NSS? So TLS connections um, for NSS? TLS connections, for okay, example. Okay, so it's uh, NSS, Net Netscape Security Services. Let me finish my sentence. Sorry. TLS connections sometimes have fingerprinting information. Sometimes me uh, message IDs have local clock information encoded into them. Those kinds of like sort of information leaks can lead to uniquely identifiable computers and other things. So, for example, if your message ID you send anonymously through Tor to their mail server gets there your message ID will show your clock, and your clock was at this second at this time, and you received it at this time, and now you send another message later. Maybe you don't want to tell someone what your time zone is. Maybe you don't want to tell them how many seconds since 1970 it is. So we wanted to do a clock independent, maybe something a little more hash-based that won't have collisions, and they were not as interested in that. And for Firefox-related components, there's just differences we make because a lot of the so-called privacy and security protocols, they don't actually necessarily worry about traffic analysis, which is hilarious, but not always something we can do anything about upstream because that's the way the protocol works. So to go back to the original question, how many people here have heard about do not track? How many people here know about safe browsing mode? So do not track is the most clicked config option in Firefox. They did a study. There are tens of millions of people who worked their way through the horrible interface to find the thing saying, please enable do not track. It doesn't do anything. That's a separate discussion. But that's the thing that the most Mozilla users wanted. And, so, and Mike Perry wrote a paper about it called Do Not Beg, by the way, which should give you some idea about the kind of privacy it gives you. So the, now let's switch over to the safe browsing mode discussion. Safe browsing mode has the wrong threat model for most people. And Mozilla actually did a study of this where they were trying to figure out what people thought they were getting when they clicked on I want safe browsing mode. And quite a few of them thought they were getting protection from the website that they were talking to, something like Tor. Uh, so part of what uh, Mike Perry's been thinking is, look, there are tens of millions of users who want do not track and they want it to work. At the same time, Safe browsing mode, a lot of the people in Mozilla and in Google and in, I, I actually don't know if the Safari people care at all, uh, but at least the first two, uh, they really want their safe browsing mode to work. The, the threat model should be, what about those advertising websites? What about all the places that you go out and you say, hey, I'm just going to this page and that page and the other page? That's what safe browsing mode should be. And a lot of people in Google and Mozilla 
Okay, a, a small number of people in Google and Mozilla have been fighting for integrating something like Tor into the browser, so when you click on safe browsing mode, you actually get safe browsing mode. So the question is, how do we get those tens of millions of people who worked their way through the interface to click on do not track, how do we get them something like Tor so they can actually get the security they thought they were getting when they checked the box? And, a, and another critical thing, I guess, to consider about do not track is that it's actually a tool for certain policy advocates to force ad companies to the table, which says, this is purely about your integrity as a company. We want you to not track people, and they are still pushing back and fighting. So even if we had a perfect technological solution or a good enough one like the Tor browser, those companies are still fighting that in a big way. And so do not track is pushed by some really great people doing good work, but it's also in order to advance a dialogue about how a lot of these companies actually aren't willing to do it in a policy-based way at all. And some are, and they want to basically try to uh, use a market-based approach of enforcing privacy or privacy by policy, where they hope that good ad, ad networks will be the ones that people end up using. I mean, it's an interesting strategy, and I think it's doomed to failure in some regards, but it was not doomed to failure in having this discussion. And in fact, we're having it right now because they successfully trolled all of us into talking about do not track and how we should move to privacy by design. And you have a Private browsing mode. Safe browsing is something else completely. Great. OK. All right. So, wow. Whew. The guy who was asking us earlier about why he should care, when, why should he care about other people or about himself. Hello, guy. I'm sorry for making an example of you earlier, but not too sorry. All right. Um, sorry if this question is not very well thought out. But in terms of law, uh, at German protests, it's illegal to wear a mask to conceal yourself. Is there a chance that at some point in the future it'll become illegal to use anonymous size? Anonymous size? Anonymous size? Anonymous size? Well, anonymous that depends anonymous. on sorry, you, you and whether or not you care. I'm sorry? That depends on you and whether or not you care. We already went over this. <laughs> I mean, really, and seriously, I mean, I come from a country which has a pretty healthy tradition of respecting anonymity, at least on paper, historically. Uh, obviously, that's not the case these days, and boy, does that make us look like assholes. But uh, that said, something says that the equivalent here is not wearing a mask on the internet. That's not the right analogy. The equivalent might be that you have security in your papers and your effects in your home, right? And the, the question might be, should criminals be able to just take your data whenever you want? Right? Should you be able to have a lock on your door? Should you be able to have the secrecy of the post? And when we talk about masks and identity, it's, I don't think it's such a clear-cut analogy. And what I would say is you'll have a lot of problems with that, and you'll end up with a lot less security if you try to get rid of that or have, as the guy from the CSU said last night at this talk, um, uh, Internet für Schein. Um, uh, which, I mean, it's ridiculous for tons of reasons. Um, I said, well, you know, that's, my German is pretty awful. So I admit I embarrass myself by speaking more than usual. And what I said was, you know, to have a driver's license, you have to know how to drive a car and how to use a car. So before you regulate the internet and require internet driver's licenses, can you just tell me if you know about TCP IP? Because if you're going to have an internet driver's license, like, you need to be able to operate your computer and understand it and how it relates to other people. Right? So I think the good news is that people that are pushing for this kind of death of anonymity online, they're going to have some trouble because they don't know what they're talking about, for one. And the other is that when they implement it, they will really have serious problems because they also don't understand a lot of other systems they interact with through the Internet. Curtains. Curtains yeah. are a wonderful <laughs> example of a privacy-enhancing technology. Isn't it great that you have something that you can put over the windows in your bedroom? Why don't we outlaw curtains? Because masks are bad and scary. Also, can you imagine how we could stop all domestic violence and crimes if we just got rid of curtains and everybody could just look in? This analogy doesn't work in Holland, by the way, where many people walk around naked in front of their window. But <laughs> if you care enough to wear pants, you care. Recognize that that caring spreads throughout the rest of it. And come hack with us on Friday, because we love you. <laughs> Really. You get a shirt, too. 
Hi. Uh, this just keeps going. <sighs> um, looking at those slides all the time, uh, I was wondering, looking at all those red dots there, uh, do you have any information how the other side works? Um, do this, <laughs> so uh, stop stopping you or, or blocking Tor, um, are there um, um, are there companies offering this to the to the countries and looking at this um, especially up there how many people are working there st uh, that they have that many many points where they change something to, to block Tor? So let me answer a few of those and then I'll let Jake answer a few more. So the red dots here are when a statistically significant drop occurs. So I think it's two standard deviations or something relative to the changes in the rest of the Tor population at the same time. So almost all of those red dots are not blocking events. They are just the numbers moving back and forth. So one of our research directions is how do you get rid of the red dots that are false positives while keeping the other ones. So uh, that uh, right around the beginning of 2011 is a real blocking event. The other little red dot towards the end of 2011 is a real one. The uh, blocking event at the beginning of 2012 was, a, was when Iran turned off SSL. So they're not targeting Tor, they're targeting Gmail and Facebook and so on. And we said, let's look like SSL because who would block SSL? They'll never block that. We've learned our lesson from that. Uh, and over at the beginning of 2013, uh, they basically turned the internet down to the point that nobody could do it for much of anything. So there are variations on why these things happen, but a lot of the red dots on many of these graphs uh, don't actually have a political thing to go with them. Uh, before I hand it over to Jake to say the word blue coat, let me tell you a story about a nice man that I met in Tunisia. He used to be an employee of the Tunisian Internet Agency. After the uh, revolution, he is now in charge of the Tunisian Internet Agency. Uh, he's actually a great guy. He has a math degree. He cares about things. He did a talk while we were in Tunisia, basically saying, I, I Tunisia, we pay Smart Filter 1.5 million US dollars every year to have a Smart Filter license in order to censor our citizens. And then there were a bunch of other interesting points, like shouldn't we be spending that $1.5 million dollars on food for our people because we need, to pay, we need to feed them now that we're there? Another interesting point was actually Smart Filter gives us a really good discount because then they go to Saudi Arabia and say, it works in Tunisia, buy it. Saudi Arabia pays full price. Tunisia is just the, 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 the first try. And then the third point was they actually outsource the operation of Smart Filter to a corporation outside of Tunisia. He wouldn't tell me where. I assume it's in France somewhere. There's some French company that gets to decide what the Tunisian military can see on the internet. This started out as a privacy question. Now it's a national sovereignty question. They've just given up everything the military does to some foreign corporation. Luca. But seriously, um, Luca. And also, um, there are a whole, whole bunch of interesting people that we've had the opportunity to meet over the years. And a lot of them are engineers who say, well, I don't have to care about any of this stuff. I just, I need to eat. That's a quote I've heard a whole bunch of times. And those people are not evil, but they're like Eichmann in their evil. They're banal. And I'm not making a Godwin's Law point here. I mean, really, literally, they consider what they do to not be important. And they think that it doesn't matter. And the thing is that Gandhi said quite clearly that no matter how small the thing is that you do, it is important that you do it. In pursuit of goodness, that is, to try to make the world a better place. Because everyone makes an impact. So when these people suggest it doesn't matter, it doesn't make an impact, they're denying their agency for change. And specifically for positive change. And instead work for negative change. There are some interesting people that when you tell them that, they change their mind. Some of them quit, some of them leak documents, some of them do all sorts of really cool stuff like turning off the equipment. I had the opportunity to meet such a person who did not do that, which was pretty interesting. I was in Burma and I uh, had a really strange experience in Burma, and, uh, or I suppose you could call it Myanmar, whatever you want to call it. And I met the guy who violated the U.S. export sanctions and brought blue coat, I believe, that's what he claimed, uh, to Burma, to censor everyone. 
and he had a business partner who had been jailed for something over five years and you know by the regime because they just happened to piss someone off in the military and so they were put in a labor camp and I met black hats where you know the essential condition for a black hattery is is born where you know having anonymity there isn't a matter of going to a work camp like that or not or being in serious harm's way and these people were in a cat and mouse game and I had the opportunity while I was there basically to meet both which was amazing right and I had breakfast at a really nice hotel which was far too nice for me in a whole bunch of ways and um, we were working on Uniprobe and it was the first place in the whole world that we'd ever tested Uniprobe and found without any special cases that we discovered censorship equipment and gathered that evidence so right as a human rights observation tool it was actually working and it worked without specialized cases which was awesome like it was the vindication of a couple of years of our of our efforts and it was really great and so at this breakfast with this guy I asked him if he could help me get co-location and we wanted to expand communication and now that Burma was opening up we were really hoping that that would happen and he was a little cagey at first and we talked for a while and then he explained you know how he came to Burma what he did how he got around the sanctions how he got around these things about how you know he reports on people and you know the government requires that so he spies on them and, and so on and he basically you know justified it in some pretty He's an awful guy, right? I'm not, to, to judge someone's character is a hard thing, but that guy was a total fucking piece of shit. Really awful, awful person. He put people in death camps probably, that would be my guess. Right? He really, single-handedly by surveilling and running his business in that country, collaborated with a military dictatorship that is currently killing the Rohingya people, for example, for being Muslims, which is not a crime, should not be a crime. And this is serious. I mean, it's really serious stuff. And during this breakfast, he told me more and more and more about this, including collusion with these companies and where people are involved from head to toe. And they understand it, and they know what they're doing it. And they do it in service of profit. And they don't care about the human cost of what they're doing at all. They haven't reasoned about it. They have no philosophy behind it. It's just profit. Those people are also terrified when I end the breakfast by telling them that I work on tour, which is pretty fun. And that is the mindset of one person. But other people, like in Syria, for example, I've received emails where they say that the Syrian government has found them and will kill their family if they don't help with the censorship. And so they kidnap them and force them to work on this if they have technical knowledge. Those people want to get out. They want to leave. And they often don't have choices. They literally can't leave the border of their country in some cases. And there's a range of people in between, of course. And some people think they're doing God's work. So for example, Blue Coat is a largely Mormon company, and I have nothing against Mormons at all. No religious bigotry in me at all. I believe in nothing equally across the board. And the thing is that I had a person approach me who worked at Blue Coat who told me that when it was discovered that Syria had acquired Blue Coat, that they started shredding documents internally. And I can't substantiate this because they shredded these documents apparently. And I asked this person to go public with it because that's really important that people know this. But he explained the philosophy inside the company is that they want to spread their fundamentalist Mormon Christian views, thus blocking things that they consider to be immoral and unethical are critical to promoting their political views. And so we see something that's really important here, which is that the things that people do in the world on the internet reflect what they actually want to see in the world and they want to see people doing. And so these people are promoting a kind of authoritarianism that comes from their desire to have the Mormon theocracy of their dreams. Those companies should not be supported by governments. They support human rights abuses. They directly want to benefit from it. They think when Syrians die that it's a good thing. Those people are morally repugnant, and yet they supposedly are good Christians. And you know, I say this personally, not as a tour project person, because I can imagine the conversation that Roger is having in his head right now. And um, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, the point is that we shouldn't judge these people so harshly, but we should be aware of these things and talk to them. So I went to RSA, for example, the security conference um, in San Francisco, and I asked some Blue Coat people, how do you personally feel about this? I didn't ask them what the company line was. I didn't ask them whether or not they supported it. I just asked them, how do you as a human being feel? And every single person that I talked to refused to answer my question, refused to make a statement on a record, and refused to do anything about it. They refused to say that it was wrong. 
And I really pressed. I said, you know, okay, I, I just wonder though, do you think it's good? Do you think it's good to support a genocidal regime? And literally, they refused to say that. And then I think it's okay to judge them pretty harshly. And in that case, the thing to do is to starve them economically, to exploit those computer systems as best as you can, and to ruin them if you have the ability to do it in any way you can to show their complicity. Just like with Deutsche Hohmark and IBM, when they build the punch card solutions to help round people up and efficiently commit genocide, those people, Thomas Watson and IBM, they had culpability, these people do too. And when those people push out patches to their software, those patches go out to tons of people who don't have the technical ability. So it's not that we're having a, an arms race necessarily with Burma or with Syria, it's that there's some Silicon Valley engineer with some morally repugnant values and a really awful company. And they find one thing and they have an amplification effect for the rest of the world. And that should stop, unless that's what we want to represent the companies like that. So FinFisher is another example of that. When Siemens exports censorship equipment to round up my friends in Bahrain, for example, that is something which should not happen. And we hopefully can change that. And there are lots of interesting stories to be had there most of the most interesting put people in danger because the good stories are about the good people and what they do to try to change this stuff. So I can't t tell you about those because, well, maybe I don't know them at all. But Let I think they exist. Let me tie in some government policy side to the corporate side. So you, it's easy to look at these companies and say, bad people work at the companies. But there's even more to it than that. I was at a meeting with the German foreign ministry and they were trying to figure out, should we as Germany outlaw exporting tools like this. And it was, I was the one technologist in the room. I guess the first lesson was they were all really proud to have a tour person there because they had you know, somebody who understands the internet and, and they're at the meeting and this is great. Hey, Roger, what do you have to say? But then all of the policy people are saying, well, yeah, you, there's a line and bad technology is over here. We should limit its export and you know, good technology is over here. And on the one hand, I was saying, yeah, you should totally limit the export of these bad things. On the other hand, I was thinking, every time you people draw a line, my tool's on the wrong side of it. So <laughs> how do I find myself here arguing, yeah, you'll know it when you see it? And there was a, an interesting point by the Privacy International lawyer saying, when they apply for export control, make them give you the brochures. Because the brochures for these companies really do say, we can round up 400 bloggers per hour. And you put it in front of the Saudi prince, and the Saudi prince says, oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I'll buy five. And if the brochures don't say that, he doesn't think of it. That's not the company that they go with. So the flip side of this, I was actually talking to a telecom engineer from the Middle East who was the other technical person at the conference, and he was saying, look, you guys are the ones who made us build the back doors in. You guys are the ones with your lawful intercept and all these other things. You made us put this extra cable in, and now you're angry when some other regime uses it. I mean, the, the guy from Saudi Arabia buys it, he plugs it in, there's an extra uh, attachment, he says, what's this for? And then the answer from his engineer is, oh, that's the lawful intercept port. And he says, oh, I am the law, let's plug that in. So this is the trickle-down effect. From the, Western corp from the Western governments who say, you know what we need? Of course, we always follow the rule of law, so what we need is back doors in these things, and therefore it will all work great. And now here we are talking about Burma with their back doors and their lawful intercept and their surveillance system. It's all connected. Yeah, and I guess one sort of awesome thing I wanted to highlight, and I was just looking this up again, uh, Moxie Marlinspike, who is one of the coolest guys ever in so many ways, from his dreadlocks to his hot air balloon, literally, and his sailboat. Um, you know, the Saudi telecom, one of the Saudi telecoms contacted him and said, hey, uh, we noticed that uh, you do interception related stuff and uh, we've already got Viber and WhatsApp and we're wondering if you can help us with everything else. Thank you for dropping that Ode, number one, <laughs> telling what you're already doing. And he replied and he's like, no, I'm not really interested in that. And they, of course, said, well, then you're helping the terrorists. And he still told them no, and he refused. And it was awesome. And because of that choice, not helping them, we learned a little about their capabilities, and we learned a lot about Moxie's integrity. And the more of us that make those decisions, the better the world gets, I think. 
So that's a very, very important thing, where it's not just about the sensors, it's about how literally accidentally helping the sensors, or helping them in, a, in an intentional way, can have some pretty amazing consequences in either direction. And before the cold, have any of you ever heard of the cold boot attack? Raise your hand. So it's a memory forensic attack that I came up with with a bunch of other people, Seth Schoen, Nadia Henninger, Ed Felton, uh, Rick Astley, you know, name it, it's a very long paper title. And um, I was contacted by uh, some people who are the equivalent of this, but for forensics, and they said, um, we really like your tools that are not yet public um, so that we can go fishing. Uh, we've got this guy's laptop, we know he's a bad guy, we have a memory image, um, we've tried to reproduce the stuff that you wrote in the paper, but we can't, and we know he's really bad, but we don't have any evidence. And if you could just help us. And I was like, yeah, I think you're just trying to hack me, it's just a joke. Um, send me a picture of you at, you know, headquarters with a shoe on your head or something like that, you know? And uh, send me a memory image too, and I'll, and I'll help you out with that to some degree, right? And I was thinking, God, I can't wait to post this on BitTorrent and send it to the defense lawyer, it'd be really great. And um, then I got an email from the Department of Homeland Security. And this was long before I ever had any trouble at Borders that was worth mentioning. And they were like, I authorize you to release this software to our, our interns. It's like, wow, it really is the case that the DHS has the component in their organization for seizing people's laptops without a warrant, then doing forensics on it without any evidence, and then they give that evidence to interns. Oh. So I replied back, and I think I also asked him for a picture of a shoe on his head or something like that. And then I said, I'd be happy to help you if you send me a memory image, but I'm not willing to release my tools to you at this time. Later, we, of course, released some tools. And I feel actually kind of bad, because I naively thought that if I released these tools to the whole world, that we would fix the problems. And we found, actually, that that was a really stupid thing. It turns out that's not the case. But it also turns out that they, I think, have since developed the capabilities, not just using the tools that we release. So in the long run, I think it was good that we did that. But in the short run, when they asked about a specific case, which was very obviously a fishing experiment, or a fishing expedition, as they might call it, um, telling them no, and also trying to maybe help the defense out, if we could get that stuff, is, I think, the right answer. And when Moxie did that with the Saudis, I think that was the right answer. And when each of us do that, when Instead of going and working at Roto and Schwartz or Siemens, you come and work with us at Tor. That helps balance out the scales of justice a little bit. And there are lots of people who I think could do that, especially in this room. So that was a super, super long answer. I'm barely able to continue standing right now. But um, thanks. Yeah, hope that helps. Hello, um, this is not a question, just a short remark from my side. Uh, my name is Georg Zoffe. I'm not a computer scientist, but a mechanical engineer working on the development of aircraft engines. I think the problem that we have here is to a great part a political problem. It's a failure of governments. In theory, governments are here to protect their people. And in our little firm, we had an, an uh, experience that dates back to the 90s. You work at Airbus? No, uh, it, it's Zoffe Aero Diesels. It's, it's a small family-owned company that develops diesel engines for small aircraft. And in the 90s, we had industrial espionage, and we didn't know what to do about it. You can't just call the next police station. So we called the BND and asked them whether they could help us. And they sent over two guys explaining us that as a technology firm, we must expect that all our telecommunication is tapped by the United States. And that was in the 90s. Can you go on record with some journalist organizations about that? Because yes, if so, I, I would really love to talk with you about that later. And I asked those guys, listen, so you are telling me that BND knows that the American agencies are tapping into German companies in order to do industrial espionage and you're doing nothing about it. Yes, it's United States, it's Germany. We can't do anything about it. So what is your recommendation? What shall we do as a company? And they recommended to us that we should, uh, whatever is of, of technological important and carries know-how, 
we should put it in an envelope and sh uh, send it via snail mail. <laughs> oh man, thanks. When we, I guess that's the answer to, are we ever going to stop? <laughs> <laughs> it works for me. So I have been running around the last 10 years whenever we met with suppliers and told them that we would exchange technically dr technical drawings only via through the letterbox. Um, well, there's some problems I, with that too, just so you know. I know, it's still problematic, but uh, people looked at me, you must be completely paranoid. But now I'm surprised that today our government is telling us they didn't know anything about it only until Edward Snowden leaked something. So we have to build political pressure onto our representatives. I totally agree. And there's a great bumper sticker in America. It's people around you don't dismiss you as being crazy. Because part of the Sosetsung of the Stasi and the Sosetsung of the FBI today and the Sosetsung of the COINTELPRO program in the United States, that, that was to try to get people to be dismissed as crazy people. So going on record, making some kind of assertion in some formal legal way and really showing that they're lying by putting that pressure is something I think is very powerful but also potentially quite dangerous. I don't know, but so it just happened, <laughs> right? But I mean, uh, I guess what you're talking about is a really fascinating, huge debate, which is not being talked about very much about national sovereignty. And it's really problematic. And at the same time, what you should do is you should help us to protect from economic espionage. So we would love it if you would run a Tor exit relay. We would love it if you ran Tor hidden services so that you could communicate with your customers and encourage them to use the Tor browser. We'd love it if you used OTR when you're chatting with people. We would love it if you helped try to end wiretapping that, like in the Greek, uh, do you guys know about the Athens affair in 2004 in, in Athens, in Greece? Anyone here? Can you? Yeah. So, in Greece, in 2004, the Prime Minister and I think 100 members of Parliament or 40 members of Parliament, some number of non-negligible you know, non number of Parliament members, were wiretapped by unknown parties and the person, at, I think it was Vodafone, that ran the telephone switch was found hanged to death in his apartment. They never found out who did it. This is pretty serious. It seems kind of obvious in light of Snowden's leaks, though I have no idea that probably might have been a government or a government agency of some kind, or some really talented people that then sold that data. This kind of stuff happens. It's real. And it's like cockroaches. If you turn on the lights in an apartment in New York City that's not very good, and you see a cockroach, you know there's probably a lot more than one. And the Athens affair is one of those things. And it's, it's evidence. You can see it. And it's the people at the top of that society being the most vulnerable. And it turns out that workers and owners of companies that produce things have the same problem they are uniquely in a position to not be able to defend themselves when the telecommunication lines are compromised and they're shared openly. Right? Roger and I were talking about this today, but Julian told me this. Julian Assange told me this a few years ago. He said that surveillance data is a kind of currency. And that currency gets traded like BitTorrent, actually, like BitTorrent ratios. And those ratios are interesting in that if you're a third-party partner, for example, in, in, in Germany's case, 
you know, what do you have? What has happened here? First of all, you're not getting the fair market price for your data, probably. But the other point is that people who have not the best intentions in mind, those people are going to use that data for their benefit. That is completely messed up. And in Germany, I would imagine, though there are some things related to 1952, um, some treaty obligations, probably it is the case that you can make some change now. There's a lot of political will for this. And probably you should be able to secure those communications. And probably you shouldn't rely on the government to do it. Because as the bumper sticker from California says, surprise, surprise, the government lies. <laughs> we should use strong mathematics to replace some of the political promises from people that don't understand the systems they're legislating. Just like, for example, women should be able to do what they need with their own body, and it shouldn't be regulated by men who don't have those body parts, right? It's super important that we recognize that those people don't know what they're doing, they're not protecting us, and actually the choices they make are harming us, and they harm economic things. My brother, for example, runs a very large company, and for the FBI to wiretap me, maybe it's fair, I tend to think they're assholes, he is vulnerable when he travels elsewhere, because he has a phone. And ironically, I don't even have a phone, because I don't want one. And I can get away with not having one for the most part, except for the ones I find in hotel rooms and places I stay sometimes. Separate point. And that is what we need to talk about, because we are talking about a trade-off between the economic cost of surveillance and supposedly things like terrorism. But the reality of the situation is there's almost no hard numbers on the losses of economic espionage or things that have to do with you know, your human life. Right? There are lots of things that might happen with that surveillance data, and that is something which needs to be measured in some ways or discussed in some ways. And right now, people are just lying. And so when you say that you know 10 years ago the BND was red-handed and telling companies this and basically saying to take countermeasures, that means that they willfully and, and knowingly left Germany in a lurch. And that you know, when your president calls Snowden a traitor, Ferrata, is that the word he used? Ferrata, I think was what he Ferrata, sorry, SPD. So, um, Ferrata, can't say it, it's too hard. It's like the city of Cologne. I have to sing it in order to pronounce it. Which is the traitor, in your opinion, for the business you're trying to run? And I don't think it's good to call them traitors, actually. I think that's a nasty word to use. But if they're gonna use that word, I wonder if it is the case that they are actually putting you in harm's way and what Snowden has done, as a counterexample, again, personal, not to our project when I say this, what Snowden appears to have done is that he appears to have told you that they actually betrayed you and put you in harm's way, which is not, in my opinion, a traitorous thing, right? It's not. In fact, it's important, and I'm very glad that he's done this. And hopefully, if you have proof of this, and you're willing to go on record about it, we can talk about it, and as a journalist, I can put you in touch with either some other journalists or I can write an article about this that lays it out. And I would love to hang a bunch of liars by their fingernails with evidence that shows it. And if you can name and shame them, I'm happy to help with that too. Um, there are some legal consequences for that. Um, you have to be very careful about it, but there are things that can be done, and if you can help do it and you know other people that can help, please do it. That's how everybody else here will get the things you want. Yeah, but so I fall over in this chair. <laughs> That's why I brought it up here. I also brought it up at another symposium uh, two weeks ago. Um, I mean, we are being lied on uh, all the time by our governments. And actually, I think what you guys are doing is something the government ought to be doing. I mean, you are protecting uh, the anonymity of, uh, of people going on the in internet. And this is something that, uh, I mean, the government should protect the people and not us fighting the government, not protecting us. Maybe a good, uh, sorry, maybe a good thing, not too sorry, maybe a good thing to uh, consider here would be having civil society and academia focused and funded by the government to help make these things sustainable when we haven't yet explored viable business models. Why is Christian's research, for example, on distributed systems and secure systems for a European research focus, why is that not being funded by every government in Europe right now? It should already be the case. And then you have a nice thing, which is that those systems maybe aren't run or created by people who are directly the ones that want to do terrible things with your data or share them with people. You need compartmentalization, right? Civil society and the government need to be separate, just as your business should be separate. I mean, there's some, some obvious things to think about there, but when he is funded 
and these people here are funded to work on it, they'll have a diverse set of interests. People that want to ladder climb and abuse authority, that's not a diverse set of interests. So, just a thought, and now. So to tie this a little bit more directly into Tor, one of the points that Jake made to, about surveillance data as a currency. So long ago, people would say, the NSA can watch a lot of the internet, so they can probably break parts of Tor, right? And I would say, yes, good thing the NSA is not your adversary. And then if their adversary is the FBI, I was imagining the FBI making a phone call to the NSA and saying, hey, can you help me out here? And I was imagining the NSA saying, I don't know what you're talking about, we can't do that, hang up. And so the, the, the different organizations who refused to talk to each other, and in particular groups like NSA who might refuse to admit that they had certain capabilities, I, we relied on this separation to provide the security side. But now what I really worry about, it's not like NSA will actually reveal that they can do this, but let's say an FBI guy calls them up and says, hey, we've got this problem, can you help me out? I'm, I'm now imagining the NSA person not saying, I don't know what you're talking about, but instead saying, hey, check this person out, and I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you how I know that, and also don't say it was me. And now they go tap his phone, and they do other stuff, and they learn about him, and then they find whatever they were looking for, if maybe or maybe not. Uh, but I, I worry that there's more collaboration between and here I was giving an example of NSA and FBI, but uh, NSA and BND, BND and FBI, someplace in Sweden, someplace all around the world. Uh, I worry about continued cooperation. Not, and they're all really very separated in terms of what they're willing to admit that they can do. But you know, why don't I help you out? You'll help me out next time. I won't provide any information about how I got it, but yeah, I've got this huge database. I'll do a, a search for you. That really scares me. So I have a more technical question. Uh, we heard that it's important to open new Tor relays or pay for the server. Um, what do you do if the NSA decides um, to crash Tor um, with opening new um, connections to Tor and generating traffic and traffic and traffic? I can answer that pretty quickly, I think, which is to say, it's like, what about the NSA running a bunch of Tor relays? Similar question, which is, why would the NSA want to take down Tor? We have to, we have to answer that question before we would um, suggest that that's the attack that they would use. And I, I'm, I'm not sold on the fact that they would want to do that. I don't know for sure, but I suspect not. And I think that it's the case that that is a generic problem that exists, which is when you run Tor relays, their CPU exhaustion, denial of service, and so on. And it's hard to know what to do about that because we need to be able to signal things to make sure that it works. We have an anonymity network. We need to make sure that anybody can connect without you know, making sure they're a good person or a bad person in some way. Um, and so it's the case that if we were to come under attack like that, it's an example of how cryptography, mathematics, computer science, and all that, it, existing in isolation is, you know, it's not enough. You need more. They use it and they rely on it. We need that to be the case so they won't want to shut it off. I know a guy in the FBI who was in a meeting with the Department of Justice people and one of them said, I know, let's make a law making Tory illegal. And he stood up and said, I use it. My colleagues use it. You will be taking away a critical asset that we use to fight criminals if you get rid of this network. And because he was in that meeting, that law didn't happen that time. So we need people at every level who are aware of why these things are important. And part of Tor's strategy is to have this wide variety of users so no matter which group you're looking at, some of them might not like it, but some of them need it. Yeah, and I, I think in Maybe as a slight quick follow-up to that. Um, it is the case that you point something out, which is what are we going to do about governments that attack community-run services and free software services? And I think that, that probably most people would say, let's make a law about it. And that would be great, except there's almost always a national security exception to laws. Like literally when I go to the doctor, I had to sign a form that said there was a national security exception to my health privacy cross that out on the form because I said if you can violate my fundamental rights I can violate this clause in the contract, um, hopefully. 
And I think the thing is we need to have some policy that stops that kind of so-called cyber war, right? And while everybody's talking about cyber war, we need to talk about cyber peace building, actually. And part of that fundamentally is to change the architecture that makes those things possible. So we need to fix vulnerabilities in computers. We need to start working on secure systems. We need to actually try to make these things much harder so that they're not the thing that people target. There are better things to target. But we also should make it so that if they're targeting it, it is really very rare, especially because of the shared anonymity concerns, especially because it is a critical tool for so many people, just the way that the internet is, for example. Uh, but this is hard. And there are a lot of people who are actively doing aggressive stuff on the internet. And I think one of the really awful things that we find from the Snowden leaks, actually, one of the original leaks was, well, you know, about President Obama's desire to have, like, all of these plans for so-called cyber war. And the thing is that if we think about what has been revealed as NSA spying, what we have to think about is not deep packet inspection alone, but it's also deep packet injection in the sense that when they talk about doing cyber war, wherever they have um, systems for spying, which they seem to have some systems around the world in some way, are they really only going to do one thing? They're just going to watch? And we probably need to limit them. And one way might be to defund them. And there's right now some debate about this in the United States. There may even be some emergency meetings happening soon at uh, the White House, for example, about this. And Obama has promised to veto whatever they do to remove the funding from NSA. Right. So, thanks. But I voted for him twice. Um, I voted for him once. I voted no the second time. That didn't work out. I was just hoping he was a radical Muslim socialist and he was going to show it the next time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, if you're going to be naive the first time, at least you can vote anarchist the second time for fun. Um, we really need to think about that, right? I mean, technical solutions are good, but economic solutions that have technical components may be better. And that's huge. And I think the economic espionage argument is a very good one. But also, showing that these guys are a bunch of fucking criminals is actually a really good argument, too. Right? So these people build prisons, so they're the only people, I think, ethically, that should be in prison. So let's hope that with a real functional democracy, we might see those people go to places where they are punished for you know, violating literally every person's fundamental basic rights. So if you wiretap one person right, without authorization, it is a crime. And if you wiretap seven billion people, right, what have you done? You have committed a crime against humanity. Right? And this is something we need to consider. And when those same people wage aggressive imperialist wars, they're using their crimes against humanity to perpetrate other more serious crimes against humanity at the same time. Calling them out on that is important, right? And that, that is critical. But also there's other things you can do. So please come hack with us on Friday. Hello. Um, I would like to come back to politics again um, because I think we are in deep shit with our mindsets and I just shortly want to tell you why. Because you just both said um, that this system is not democratic and I totally agree with you on that. And you um, earlier said that older people are quite unwilling to learn stuff and I also totally agree again. But our fail logic just keeps saying that we have to put up political pressure and demanding things. But this, I think this is quite ironic because it's impossible per se to demand in an undemocratic system from people who doesn't understand. So my interpretation of hacker ethics is that we have to do it ourselves. Um, so um, I just... Um, yeah, we, I think we should start um, seeing our political system like code and ask ourselves how to improve. And so my question is, how do we change the law? Because only good law is a, a good basis for a better um, reasoning and better um, um, acting from, by people. And is it a good idea to say that we have to focus more on to getting in the parliaments? And shouldn't we try ourselves to be governments, even as it sounds quite worse? Um, yeah. The designated politician, thanks. <laughs> so, I try to stand up when I say this now. But um, the thing is, whoops, I lose my mic. Um, the thing is that I, 
don't think you totally understood all the points that we made, but most of the way you did. Um, yes, I think we should try to be governments, or I think we should try to do some of the things that currently people think are jobs that should be done by governments. But I think that law is important, but it doesn't matter about making new laws if fundamental laws are being disregarded. So first you need the rule of law if you're gonna use law as a policy or policy as some kind of tool for ensuring social order or uh, some kind of system that is you know, integrated and, and, and has everything put together. So what politicians are ensuring that the laws that have already been broken are being followed or that those people who have committed those crimes are doing something about it. That's, I mean, that's a really good start. And I don't know, I mean, I'm not a German, and well, I guess I live in Berlin as of three weeks ago or something like that. Um, and right now I'm living in Munich for another two days. Um, I don't know how to fix the problems we have here, but as an American, I look at your democracy and I think, God, what are you complaining about? Seriously, that's what I think. I think, wow, you have the ability to meet with your politicians. In fact, I've met with some of your politicians. I've met members of German parliament in the last week and explained some things to them. And they, you know, in some cases kind of understood and in other cases understood really well. And I've been trying to meet with my Congress critters United States now for four years, and I literally have not been able to meet with them in four years of intense like FBI harassment and U.S. government harassment. And you know, it's not so bad here, right? When I like, I, I often tell my German friends, you know, I have a Jewish last name and I'm standing in Germany. No matter how bad it is, you can always make it better, right? And we can make it better. I'm not exactly sure of the right way to make it better. But you do need policy and code, you need to trust, but you also need to verify. And, and I think that that's super important to do. And I think cynicism is one of the first things that you've got to get away from. You may, you may not have it as much as other people, but I detect a little bit of it. And then I think it's also completely critical that we do build systems that are actually working and usable and that they are you know, maybe even codified in law. So that would be really helpful. Like, why is it that phone calls aren't end-to-end -end encrypted in Germany? That would be a fantastic law. It will stop all illegal wiretapping right on the spot that can't break the crypto that's used. Why is it that email, for example, isn't required by the law, as there are already email regulations, to make it so that it's encrypted when it leaves the mail server and goes somewhere else? And the answer is sometimes because those politicians don't understand it, and sometimes because they have a conflict of interest. So you should find those conflicts of interest and you should expose them. You should do this with many different tactics, but one of them is document leaking. And there are lots of things that you can do about that. And I say that personally as myself, not as a Tor project person. That is important, right? The truth will, in some cases, help, at least to expose what is actually the situation. And that can be really good. And I would really encourage you to do that. And now Roger's gonna say something too, and I'm really looking one of the amazing things about technology is that it doesn't care what the policy is. It doesn't care now or in the future, and it doesn't, doesn't matter whether you're talking about this country or that country. So here we are talking about German policies, and that's great, but there are a lot of other places around the world that have different situations. It is really important to try to, to fix the, the political and legal and social and cultural uh, world around you. Uh, it really depends what you're best at changing. If you are working in the legal system, uh, then, then improving the laws that people are gonna make anyway is a really useful thing to do. But the question is about scalability. We need the whole world to be working on improving things in various ways. Uh, the approach that we're taking, we're building a tool that can change the world all around the world regardless of what some politician somewhere in the world doesn't understand. So part of what our approach is is we're going to change the facts and let them catch up. And we need to let them catch up and we need to teach them and we need to make them better at it. I was watching a YouTube video from some uh, senator in Australia a little while ago who really understood what was going on and he was in an empty room talking to the rest of Congress who didn't bother showing up. And I mean, there are a lot of problems there, but we need to somehow make progress on all fronts. Do what you can do best. And uh, a second thing I would say is that Thoreau talked a little bit about this in his essay on civil disobedience. And one of the things that he said, I mean, he said a lot, I would really encourage you to read that, um, that essay. But uh, one of the key points that he makes in this essay 
is this idea that people are often saying they won't go along with things. And if someone were to challenge them, then they would say no. And in his case, he was talking about the Mexican-American War at the time. And he said in this that um, effectively those same people, however, pay into the public coffers, that is, they pay taxes. Right? And this, to me, is something which is important, which is there's the intentional, obvious, conflict-oriented way of dealing with it, and then there's all the other ways we support those things. So, you know, if you have some issues with the auto industry or something, and then you go and you drive a car, but you say, no one will ever be able to force me to drive a car, what have you done? And Thoreau's article, or his essay, is really good. And he also talks about how, and I mentioned this before, democracy is a point on a progression of human freedom. And it's maybe not the last point. I mean, the reason I work on these technologies, other than the fact that I am very loyal to Roger and grateful for all the things that he has taught me, because I want to travel through space, and I want to die on Mars. And as Elon Musk, yeah, it was Elon Musk who said it, he said, but not on impact. And that is, that is, I think, fantastic. And the thing is, we aren't going to get off this rock and diversify the human race throughout the solar system and have our intergalactic hacking community really be intergalactic if we don't have freedom of speech and freedom of thought, right? I don't work on this because anonymity is an end in itself, just like democracy is not an end in itself. So if you want to die on Mars with me too, maybe we can make some changes to make that happen. And maybe if we're lucky, we can live long enough to live forever too. But he just handed me a, a thing which I wanted to read to you, and this is not, uh, I don't know anything about it, but he says, tomorrow there's a demonstration of stop watching us. Was it, is it, oh, it's Saturday, okay. I won't be here, but um, on the 27th at noon at Prince Karol Palace, um, there's a stop watching us demo. Um, that might be an interesting thing to do, to go and meet people that are interested in this stuff. And what I hope is that, I see you are wearing a green shirt, and I know that there are some pirates in the audience, and I met some CSU people last night, and I think it'd be great if every political party in Germany recognized that you don't have political parties if you don't have a sovereign nation. You basically just have factions of um, a colony, so I hope that you guys can put aside whatever differences you perceive and work together on this to reduce the ability for each other to ruin each other, which is hard. But I hope you do it. And uh, this might be a good thing. I don't know. I hope you go. So I hope that helps. And good luck. Don't be cynical. Thank you very much. And thank you for mentioning feminism. So kind of talked a lot about political stuff. Um, I'm a computer scientist and I would kind of like to ask more about project related stuff. For example, the first question, which I'm not sure if you will answer it is, if you get pressure from an employer or from a government agency in case you are the leader of the company yourself to build in a backdoor or something, can you give any tips on how to respond or what you should do? That's the part that I'm not necessarily expecting you to answer because I have one answer to that from the U.S. perspective. I talk to a lot of companies who say, when the government comes to you and they have a legal requirement and it comes with a secrecy requirement, you have to do it. And there are still a lot of people in the U.S. and again, a lot of people in Germany who say, when the government mandates that you change your software like this, you have to do it because what choice do you have? The, you do have a choice. You can stop doing your thing. If you're running a webmail service and they come to you and they say put a back door in it stop running your webmail service if you're running and if you're writing code for an anonymity system and people come to you and they say please change it like this you can stop working on your anonymity system at every point you have a choice this is especially important in the context of the lawful intercept Kalia 2 that they're working on, where they will mandate backdoors in all communication services. So-called lawful intercept. So, uh, fortunately, there are a lot of jurisdictions around the world. If the U.S. comes to you and mandates something, you don't have to worry about that. If Germany comes to you and mandates something, tell everybody, and then stop doing your thing. Make as many people as possible angry, somebody else will pick it up. If we stop working on Tor in the U.S. because some stupid law enforcement tries to do something stupid, Somebody else has to help us. Yeah, hey, it's so cool to live in Germany. Yeah, okay, Fantastic. that's actually great that you answered that way because that kind of gives me motivation to ask the second question, which is... Um, uh, can, I, can I respond to the first yeah. one as well? There are many different ways that a government might approach. So some of them might approach by asking for a back door. 
but the, the thing I have experienced in the last several years is Suzette's song. Right? Are you all familiar with this concept at all? Do, am I saying it wrong? Sersetzung? Sersetzung? Disintegration, right? Sersetzung. Sersetzung. <laughs> Danke. <laughs> Danke schön. <laughs> mein Herr. <laughs> Meine neue deutsche Lehrer. Ich mag dich so viel. <laughs> that is what I have experienced in the last four years because those guys know that I will never ever compromise on these things. They will have to break into my computers. They have. They'll have to put people with night vision goggles outside my partner's house and watch her sleep at night. And they have. They would have to stop me at the border and try to backdoor my computers. But I will beat them. And I will beat them at every step and I will resist because what Roger said is true which is that I have a choice. I have a choice about what I will do with my life, right? I have a choice about what will come. And that is really important to keep that. And at some point I might lose those choices because I might not be free. But the important thing to recognize is that there are many ways that it will come. And that will bring a lot of stress on your friendships and on your relationships. And it becomes a burden. It's like a Midas touch almost, right? It's like being marked in the, you know, in the McCarthyist era or by the Stasi. Right? And that kind of stuff is an effort to get you to quit in some cases. Or at least I've literally been told that I should stop doing this by government agents. And my response to them, other than packing little prank canned snakes into fake nut cans and filling it with glitter, so that when they search my luggage that shoots glitter everywhere, <laughs> which is fantastic by the way. <laughs> I highly recommend if you ever go to America that you do this. It's especially great if they search your luggage when you're not around because now your luggage is filled with glitter and you know what happened. <laughs> right? But the, the point is that I just tell them straight up, no, because you're wrong. And you are a tool of the state and you do not understand what you do. You are only following orders. And the Nuremberg Principle actually specifically suggests that when you have unjust or illegal orders, you have a higher duty than to the laws of your state that are wrong. And I think that those are awesome, awesome ideas. And so for me, I would leave. And you know, recently I made that choice to leave the United States, and it's actually super awful. And uh, the Prime Minister of the Tibetan government in exile said something to me which really moved me. I, I do some work with the Central Tibetan Administration in Dharmshala in India, and um, I, I'm friends with some of these Tibetans because of the genocide they've suffered in China. And I've met them and worked with them on tour-related things, for example. And he said, some of us have been in exile for a long time. And some of us are just beginning our exile. You have to learn to sustain. And that's a horrible thing to hear from someone, but that's a wise thing to hear. And so the thing is, you've got to do the things that you can live with. And for me, I could not live with myself knowing what I know about the world and quitting and letting the bastards win. And I think Julian Assange just said something just as fantastic, although a lot less elegant. He said, I enjoy crushing bastards. And I'm with Julian on this. And so I hope if you have been approached by people like that, which, or if you know someone that has, for example, I hope that what you'll do is you will make similar choices and it's find kind of people. A, find it's a forward people. question. Because I'm expecting to be, or it's likely that at some time in our lives, most people who study computer science will be, if the system continues like this. So. Yeah, so are you familiar with the, the works of Gene Sharp by any chance? He wrote a book called From Dictatorship to Democracy? At all? No? He's a really interesting um, writer. You should check him out. But um, one of the things that he talks about is how the state or corporations or other people, power structures maintain power is through a process known as atomization. So that is, you are connected to everyone in this room. As soon as someone starts bossing someone else around in this room, non-consensually, um, a lot of us would stand up and tell them to stop. But as soon as that person is isolated in a room and that person is telling them to do it under pressure, they feel alone, they feel the context is alone and so on, and that person begins to gain power over that other person. So part of the thing to recognize is that even though you feel like you're alone and that you might even die from the situation, that you will die from the situation or one like it eventually and you just have to accept that fact, but you are not alone and you should find allies and work with them. And when you do that, you will probably find that you don't have the worst outcome that you thought. This is where we need to mention EFF and Bits of Freedom 
and the Chaos Computer Club, and there aren't enough organizations like this around the world. A few years ago, uh, Jake and I were lamenting that where is the EFF in Europe? Bits of Freedom is great. They're doing great things. They're one organization in one country. We need to strengthen these organizations so there are groups who can help us fight all of these things. But also not to just use violence metaphors. We need to build alternatives, not just fight. We need to do things that make things workable so that people, when they know about it, have the agency to make a different choice. And then we have the ability to change things in a big way. And in fact, Bill Hicks, the greatest US comedian to ever live, he made a great joke. He said, did you hear that there's a war on drugs and every time you're high, you're winning it? <laughs> well, there's a war on privacy, anonymity, and autonomy. And every time that you use Tor, every time you run a relay, every time you use cryptography where you refuse to submit to authority, you're winning it. And when you refuse to backdoor things and to be complicit, you're helping others win too. Okay, so that leads to the second part of my question, which is uh, how do you, if you run an open source project and you have lots of people contributing, and especially people contributing minor stuff like localization or that kind of stuff, how do you prevent them from building backdoors because they are possibly pressured with much stronger means than what you experience, like their families being killed or other people's lives being involved, although where they do not have control or where they should not feel responsible for taking actions that heavily influence their lives. So the question is how do we vet contributions or how do we, as the community grows, make sure there are no people in it who won't roll over? How do you sort out people like that fat brat who snitched on Julian Assange? <laughs> wow, thank you for saying that. Super appreciate that, just wanted to call that out. I was okay answering your question until that last sentence. Now I'm pausing. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Free software and open source software that is openly specified and peer reviewed, in some cases moves as slow as molasses. What that also means is that it gives us the ability to have many competent people review it in different forums. This is pretty important. Having experts helps us. Having experts around us who will vet the other experts' opinions, maybe even without knowing who the original expert was, so there's no weird ego stuff going on, is even better. From a technical perspective, part of that is using stuff like Git, doing code signing of actual code, or sending patches in a way where we verify that the source is who we think it is. Another part is that we actually think and reason about the changes that are being made. That's a really big part, and that's also to say that we also make changes to code where we do all of those things, and then we still look for the cohesive picture. Like, did these patches change timing information? And we think about the big picture set of things we need to worry about in our threat model. There's a Tor design proposal process where you write up, this is how I think the design should change, these are the impacts on anonymity and performance and other things, here are all the other trade-offs, and then there's a discussion process. Uh, I think the key point is the openness and the transparency. It all has to happen in public, that way everybody else here can look at it. All of our code is public. We're, we're big enough at this point that there are anonymous people showing up using Tor on IRC saying, line 7201, I think you have a bug. That's great. We need that community or really hard to write perfect software. Yeah, another thing is that we try to have multiple implementations. So pretty soon there's going to be a Java implementation of Tor called ORCID, which will be integrated in a piece of software called MARTIS, which is a human rights reporting tool produced by a nonprofit that helps blind people to read in California called, uh, well, it's MARTIS Benetech, and I don't know what the uh, name of their blind people reading software is, actually, which is kind of Bookshare, that's what it is. Thank you, Gunnar. Um, that is really helpful. Because if, for example, we were wrong about all those things, they would also have to add it to a diverse set of clients. That's very helpful. So having an open specification, very important. Having open implementation, very important. Having multiple implementations, very important. Having independent third-party reviews of all of that, very important. That's a lot to do, right? That's a lot of work. So that's why we think that we'd like other people to come and join us instead of, in some cases, starting new things. Because we can maybe change the software to make it meet the same goals and have all those processes undertaken already. And in the case of uh, 
let's say, the human element, which I think is pretty critical, the thing we have to recognize is we're gonna get this stuff wrong. So for example, there was once a bug in Tor where our crypto was not as good as we had hoped it would be, and the third party implementation found it. And because we assume good faith with everybody involved, and this is actually before my time, uh, or at least I didn't understand it when it happened, and I only remembered it retroactively. It was a bunch of developers in Dresden who were building a compatible Tor client, and it turns out that our AES implementation and their AES implementation matched for the first thousand bytes or so, and then after that it diverged. Theirs was right, ours was wrong. So that's a great thing, and because they assumed good faith, instead of having a big dramatic blow up about it, we found it and fixed it, and everything got better as a result. The human component is a, a hard one, and so what we need to do is not just judge the human component, but also consider the work product that comes out of it. And all of the Tor project related products, or projects, or software designs, or whatever, or research, we try to make it so that everyone can evaluate those things. And it doesn't matter that you don't like my political beliefs, or I don't like yours, or something like that, because you can actually trust, or not trust, and then verify, and decide that it's what you expect it to be. But, you know, it is important to recognize that people like the guy you're talking about, the Icelandic guy, the Adrian Lamo of Iceland, um, those people might not just try to do infiltration, they might try to do some of the Sosetsung stuff. And in fact, Sabu, for example, who is the guy that snitched on Jeremy Hammond, and Q both tried to entrap me. So when you meet people like that, you know, you just have to recognize them if you can and refuse to do things with people like that. So if they ask you to do illegal things, then you should deny doing it, for example. And you should, I don't think you should do something terrible to them, for example. I don't think you should snitch on them. I think you should just not work with people like that. And if they are truly going to do good things, then they can do those good things on their own and not present a risk to you. And so security culture and compartmentalization, as the anarchists talk about it, or security culture, if you Google that and the word anarchism, you'll find a great guideline for working on goals openly in a secure way where you do these things and you don't have to worry too much about that. And then on the flip side, you've got to check all the stuff that's happening. Because it might not be that Roger is compromised. It might be that someone compromises you know, some piece of software that he might use or something and then pretends to be him. So you need to solve both of those problems at the same time. And, you know, fortunately, Fortunately, in my pocket is a business card with my PGP key on it, so it's all fine. Yeah, if he is who he says he is, then you can verify it if you just happen to get that last card. But, I mean, your, your questions are really good, and I, you definitely get a shirt. And I'm, I'm glad that you, you know, asked them. And, I, you know, in my case, like with my, with my family, for example, my mother had some very serious issues, and I think that it was directly related to my political and techno technological, uh, let's say, achievements. And uh, achievement unlocked, she spent 18 months in the United States in a jail without a trial. And I had to spend about thirty-five dollars to $40,000 to hire lawyers to get her out. And that weighs very heavily. And that is part of the thing, in some cases, you take on for certain high-profile projects. That might have been because of my association with Julian or WikiLeaks, because that's basically what they told her. And you know, I say this again, not as a Tor project person when I, when I say this. But that kind of stuff, if you're not willing to do those things, the best thing that you can do, if you don't want those things to happen, the best thing you can do is just be honest with everybody about it. And if you ever decide you want to quit, do that too. Quit and have integrity. Recognize the agency that you have and stop doing things instead of being used as an agent of the state and harming people, especially people that don't understand how they're being harmed, especially people that would be really harmed in ways you don't understand at all. And that, I think, is very powerful. So recognizing that you can be not only the change you want to see in the world, as Gandhi would say, but also the trouble. Doing that is really useful. So in the context of Tor relay operators, we can imagine somebody coming up to somebody who runs a Tor relay and saying, hey, can you add this back door in? And the clear answer is, heck no, I'll turn off my relay if that's what you want, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change it. So that's easy to say, and I hope obvious. The thing that makes me more worried is the telco, the upstream that is, helping, that, that is selling the service to the person who's running the Tor relay, they already put the back door in. So here I am saying, yeah, you don't worry about relays being backdoored because hopefully enough of the relay operators will have integrity, but the entire internet is being backdoored at this point by corporations who think it's in their best interest economically. Tough problem to solve. Yeah. Thank you.
thanks for the question again. Yeah, okay. Uh, my question, uh, my first question was actually for the header data, for example. Uh, you mentioned Tor Birdie, or I think it was Tor Birdie. Yeah, Tor Birdie. And um, I know, I knew these um, problems with um, header data, for example, uh, Thunderbird sends the X client identification which server, uh, which version it uses. Yeah, we removed that with Tor Birdie. So that we, we have a paper that specifies all the stuff we thought we needed to do to be able to uh, anonymize a client. So we remove a lot of header information, modify header information we need to send when we can. And a few things Thunderbird doesn't allow us uh, to do. Uh, we have patches which are slowly but surely working their way through the process to be fixed. Yeah, um, you, you answered my question practically the same time I sat here down, so I had some time to think about a new one. Um, I'm more affiliated with another um, anonymiz anonymization um, program called I2P. I hope you know it. Uh, my question is more like, um, do you guys work together in the sense of uh, looking at each other codes and see, um, for example, this is a good stuff, we can implement this in the Tor project or vice versa. For example, I2P is more decentralized. There are less central points like the um, directory server, as far as I know. And um, the question is, are you working, are you taking the advantages of both sides? One of the big challenges we have, so, so Tor's approach in terms of what features we put in is that we think really hard about all of them and we try to get a lot of researchers and academics to write papers and analyze them. And there's a, a conference called the Privacy Enhancing Technology Symposium where dozens of professors and their research groups get together to think about these things. Tor's approach is until we really understand what it's going to do, we don't put it in. I2P, at least in the past, their approach was this one looks pretty good, let's put it in. So that means that I2P has a bunch of features that are better than Tor's features. It also has a bunch of features that are way worse than Tor's features, and I can't tell you which ones are which. That's really scary. So do we work together looking at code? Not, uh, we're busy looking at our code. Some of the Tor people look at the code. There, there isn't as much collaboration as there should be. Do we work together in terms of analyzing features and the anonymity impacts of them? We try to analyze anonymity impacts of potential changes in Tor. Some of those are related to I2P. Part of the problem from I2P's perspective is that they haven't hit the critical mass that makes the research community look at them. And that means that a lot of professors, when they're going to analyze something, they decide to analyze something in Tor. So uh, that's one of the things that I love most about what Christian does. He has looked at Tor, but he also has grad students, and he says, hey, can you look at I2P? And they spend the first 80% of the research paper teaching you what I2P is. And then the last 20% breaking it, and that's great, but it, uh, there's a lot of critical mass around Tor already. And that comes not just from popularity, it also comes from the fact that we write specifications to say this is how it works. We have design documents. We are as transparent as we can about what we do and why we do it and what we think that does to anonymity. And I2P has not caught up in terms of that transparency and documentation of what's going on. So there's a lot, that, that there's a lot of work involved in transparency to catch the attention of the researchers. And I don't know how to get I2P to work on that. I have a follow-up to that also. So, I have always thought that there's a bit of a split between I2P and Tor in a way that makes me very sad, in that I think it is a waste of brain space to have that kind of a difference. However, we have some technological reasons for this. So for example, the fact that we write in the C programming language and they do it in Java, that causes a problem. But with ORCID, it is a Java application which is designed for desktop and maybe soon Android use. It would be fantastic if I2P integrated that and then when they experimented with things, you could configure it so that it was in fact a Tor client or you could add experimental features of I2P together and that would be amazing because then we could say there's a conservative approach which we think is peer reviewed, it's these features. If you'd like to flip some bits to make it do something else, here are these other features. That would be great and that would really increase the, the cross pollination between the communities. Also, I think I2P's documentation has really gotten a lot better these days. And I think the code is a lot better these days. I even think Java is almost tolerable if you use the hippie JVM. 
not Sun's JDK stuff, for example. And that's, I think, good. And I don't think there's as much animosity. I mean, talk about inside baseball, this question. It's really like, whew, never going to believe what happened the other day at the baseball match. Um, it's, it's too bad in some ways that there is this weirdness there. And in some cases, I think the problem is that it's like, people say stuff like, oh, Tor is too centralized and I2P is more decentralized. And the thing is that like, there are different designs that exist. And YAP, for example, I2P and Tor, they're complementary, right? And what they are complementary to is the fact that they're community-based, free software designs that have privacy by design, and they're different experiments. And we're all working on different experiments. But I would never use I2P in a place where it was the only thing I used to protect my life. I wouldn't do that with YAP either, although I would tend to think YAP is a little bit better in terms of its academic and peer reviews, like it's very rigorously reviewed. And I do risk my life and use Tor to protect it on a daily basis. Well, maybe I don't risk it every day, but I use Tor every day with the hopes that it will protect me. And when I'm in a place like Burma, I don't in good conscience teach people about I2P and say, use this instead of Tor. Or, yeah, use this instead of Tor and buy a PaySafe card in Germany the next time you happen to be leaving the country if you ever get permission to do so, right? Or something like this. <clears throat> and so, what I wish is that some of the I2P developers would learn to program in C, or if they know how to program in C, start submitting experimental features to Tor that are turned off. For example, it would be great to have an alpha mixing uh, uh, feature built into Tor. There are some good peer-reviewed papers about that. It's a good summer of code project, probably, or do we call it Prism Summer of Code now? And Google Summer, I don't know. But um, that would be useful. I think also it would be really fantastic if we looked at having a way for um, nodes which are not signed by the directory authority to join a DHT and have that DHT be available, like let's say the way that the flood fill network on I2P works, to have that available also to all Tor users, but turned off by default, and then a user could turn it on and get all those same features and have interoperability between an I2P Java client and a C client, that would be really fantastic. And so we would love some of those people to come over to our community, but in a lot of ways, the hostility about saying we're too centralized or something like that, it just leads to discussions like, yes, but every single one of your users can be manned in the middle the very moment anyone starts it, and then they're de-anonymized, and by the way, Christian Grudhoff broke it 10 different ways in the last five minutes while thinking about it, and has four published papers on it, and so do other people. That is not a productive way to go down the collaboration path. So if you know some I2P people that want to do that, they should come to our hack day on Friday, for example. And I think we should try to unify this because the enemy, if you want to use that language, the enemy is people who build centralized services that are backdoor, that want to harm us, that wish to spy on us, that wish to be our masters. And we should reject those people and not fight amongst ourselves. That's really important to do that. Yeah, I concur with uh, your proposal of working uh, together with I2P and Tor, of course. And, um, but, of course, uh, I want to use this opportunity to promote a little bit of I2P and I hope if you're interested in looking for this topic in um, information theory or... I'd, I'm not an engineer in this area, but uh, I like this topic, of course. So, if you want to um, make something new, you see Tor is not, not, quite, um, not quite completely discovered all the faults. There may, the flaws, there may be there, but in I2P, I think there are flaws and they need to be discovered. So if you need a topic, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, appreciate that. And you should come to our hack day as well. And I think there are a couple questions and then maybe the four hour marathon where we have not used the bathroom once. We'll move to a vegetarian restaurant so that we can have some food and not pass out. Is there a good vegetarian place in Munich? I have yet to find one. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we should eat something someday. Hello. So, uh, these my questions are quick. Us. Let's see about the answers. Um, the first one is with that Prism stuff. Uh, we basically learned that most large ISPs uh, aren't to be trusted. How bad do you think the problem actually is worldwide or in Germany? Um, do I have to fund my own ISP? Would that help? Wow. Do I have to create a, a sub-internet, peer-to-peer, something? I think the Freifunk project in Berlin is awesome. And I think we need to have things like Freifunk 
everywhere in the world, and it's very important. And how bad is the problem? Here's what I think. I think the NSA watches the entire planet, and they have different capabilities in different places, and I think it's a serious problem. It's a threat not only to national sovereignty, but it's actually a threat in general to democracy and the human race overall. And how much do we need to worry about it? Well, today we might not need to worry about it very much, but tomorrow we might need to. And if there happens to be a regime change in the United States for the worse, if that's even possible, then I think we have a lot to worry about in a big way. And I think you personally have something to worry about because unless you, do you have an American passport in your pocket? It sounds like you have a German accent when you speak English. Only German? So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I have a friend who used to joke, would you rather live under American domestic or foreign policy? And, you know, most of the people would respond, well, domestic, of course. And that's a privilege that most people cannot afford. And most people, as in there are 7 billion people on the planet, and more than 6 billion of them don't get that privilege. And probably a lot, actually more than that, in, a, in an important way. And you're not, you're not one of those people that gets that privilege. So should you be worried about it? Totally. Because the moment that it is useful to screw you over and use that data to harm you, and I would benefit even a little bit, maybe not me personally, but the idea of an American citizen, those people will opportunistically take it. And in terms of the technical capabilities of the NSA, it's hard to say entirely, but from what we've learned from the Snowden League so far, things like what have been published in O Globo, and again, not as a Tor project person, just as my personal opinion, actually, technically as a freelance journalist for Der Spiegel, what I would say is, it is really scary. And it is scary because the program X Keyscore, for example, is a database interface to basically search through a lot of data systems. But if you look at the slides that have been released, it's not just search and it's not just collection. It's also analytics. I just let that sink in for a moment. It means that it is not just a spying network, it means it is an autonomous thinking network based on spying data. It's not Skynet. <laughs> but we do have Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> which is an, actually a very interesting point. There may be something to that theory. But this is, this is serious stuff. And I think the answer is yes, start an ISP. Start an ISP where if you want to do internet exchange points with that ISP, mandatory crypto, keys in hardware, ephemeral sessions for everything. There's a project that's called Leap, L-E-A-P dot S-E. And this is a project run by some amazing free software developers. A couple of them are in this room right now, I think, or at least one was at some point. And they are working on a privacy by design internet service provider where you have privacy by design file sharing, privacy by design encrypted email, privacy by design, you know, all of the different things we want to accomplish, including encrypted voice over IP, ways to reach the Tor network, ways to reach your home ISP, Tor hidden services for things, ways that the customer endpoint in the house will be privacy enhanced as well. So be the first ISP in Germany that deploys Leap's software and hardware designs so that when someone comes knocking and even if they have a warrant, you can tell them that you don't have any data honestly and you don't comply because you can't, because you just don't have it. And that would be huge to do that. And Zuko, um, who runs Least Authority, uh, which is a um, part of, uh, some conglomerate of awesome free software projects, is a thing that's called Tahoe Least uh, Authoritative File System, or Tahoe Laughs. And he has this idea, it's called Provider Independent Security, or um, Redundant Array of Inexpensive Clouds, the rake, I think is what he calls it. And the idea is that you can reduce the security properties of certain providers to a single one, which is availability. Working on those things, especially if you find a financial model, it's clear that by Dropbox's success, it's not through competence. And it's not through integrity, because they were on the PRISM slides. They just hadn't yet joined, I think. Who knows now, right? But if you look at Spider Oak, for example, they do the same thing as Dropbox, but they don't have the keys. And they even have deduplication. Same with least authoritative file system. And least authority is the, is the company name? least authority file system, and also least authority the company name? Yeah, they also provide a cloud service where they, sorry, after talking for four something hours, I'm starting to lose my head, but uh, talking in English is really hard after being in Germany for a while, so I hope you'll forgive me. This foreign land has a different word for everything. So while you're building your new ISP, 
you need to think about the centralization of the internet. Yeah. So you can't go to Deutsche Telekom and say, hey, can I borrow a one gigabit connection and I'll run an ISP there, and then Deutsche, Deutsche Telekom will be your upstream and they'll take care of that internet thing for you, that's gonna go wrong. So it really is about who you can peer with and how you can avoid the tier one ISPs that are already the backbone of the internet and already doing deals with everybody. Also use strong cryptography really strong cryptography. If it seems kind of overkill for what you're choosing, do it, it's fine. You won't be sorry if you were doing a little bit of extra crypto. You will be very sorry if 100 years from now, you could have increased the bit size of a symmetric block cipher by a, you know, two, for example, and that would be the difference between having a decryptable ciphertext and not, right? It's a little annoying, but for almost everyone involved, no one will even notice it. And that might be useful, especially with quantum computers when it comes to block ciphers, right? I mean, maybe it'll make an impact, maybe it won't. Some other things will fall apart. Nonetheless, you're still doing better than if you're stuck with these corporate ISPs, some of which are gagged and some of which are um, well, basically forced. And you should try, if you can, to find an economically sustainable model so that it's not just worth your time, but it's actually something that sustains you in the rest of your life. That's something that Zuko, for example, is working on, and I think that it's fairly important for that to happen. And I think you should consider the Zeta Cartel model, which he originally suggested to me, which is when someone comes, yes, you may win in a legal court, but if they take your family, you will comply. So build a system that survives and doesn't put your users in harm's way when that happens. And the more distributed and decentralized it gets, the better. And the more verifiable it gets, the better. And that is an important thing. And if not you, who? And if not now, when? One short question. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the effort and time you spent with us to answer all these questions. Great work you are doing. Thanks for staying here. <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. I can't believe you guys have sat here for four hours. <laughs> um, I. I read, read your Snowden interview in Spiegel and um, uh, I'm wondering, uh, they are talking about thousands of people involved, involved into this project. Um, I'm wondering that not more people now coming out of their rooms and um, also prove these prison projects and so on. Is there maybe something missing, a pack, package from Tor for people they want to come out? and present information and to keep, keep them really invisible, invisible, not only browsing, but for um, all the other uh, communication, uh, a, a starter package for them, that someone knows how to make secure email, browsing, chatting, and so on. You know, this is gonna be terrible, but I really need to get up and use the restroom before I answer that question. So maybe someone else has a second question, and I can avoid the horrible disaster that is impending in this exact moment. I can give a start to it. Jake thinks I shouldn't answer this question. Let me try uh, a couple of answers that maybe he will appreciate while he's gone, or not even know about while he's out of the room. So I remember chatting with uh, the folks who were running the Global Leaks project a while ago. And what they wanted to do was have a Global Leaks version of the Tor browser bundle. And it would have bookmarks and you can, you know, it's all set up so you download it, it pops up the, home, the default homepage is the way to send your stuff. And the, the usage model, the only one that we could come up with that would reasonably happen that way is, I'm some guy with a document, I wanna leak it, so I go to globalleaks.org, I fetch the thing, now I have that thing, now I anonymously do something with that thing. Later somebody notices that I have the global leaks leaking anonymity tool in my taskbar. This is not gonna go well for me. So part of the realization is it needs to be the standard Tor browser bundle that everybody has and then somehow, somehow in, other, in some other way, we need to provide instructions for people who need to do that sort of thing. So part of the goal is you need to have the same anonymity set, anonymity group, as everybody else. So in terms of can we provide perfect software to do all of this so that everybody can do everything safely? Try Tails, it's pretty good. Except if you wanted secure email, 
you're going to have to use some sort of mail server somewhere. Do you run your own? I do. I bet not everybody does. Do you use Gmail? Are there problems? Depends whose adversary you've got. Was that the final question? Or Jake was hoping there would be another one, but then he ran out of the room. Yeah, I think it's time to wrap up. Um, and uh, thank our remaining speaker. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually several rows of Tor developers over here in the front row and scattered throughout the audience are other Tor developers. So we would love to help answer your questions and teach you more about Tor. Also, if you actually uh, think that going to bed about right now would be fine, uh, we'll be around on Friday as well. So please drop by and help us save the world. And as organizer, I would appreciate it if you could help us make sure that at least not too many bottles and posters in particular are left over. Take a poster. Give one to your friends. Thank you. Good night.